Now I've lost my agenda. Yeah. Right, so if everybody's happy, we're going to start the meeting. So Esme is now recording, is that correct? Yes, now recording. Great. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome to the Audit and Transparency Committee meeting, 8th of March. Um, Esme, any apologies for absence? We haven't received any apologies for absence, no. Um, any other attendees to this meeting? Um, we have Councillor Blakeman attending. Excellent. And is she on? I'm here, yes. Excellent. OK, great. Um, yeah. Right. Any declarations of interest? No. no. I'll take that as a no. Um, chair, my standing uh, declaration of interest with Standard yeah. Chartered Bank, if that could be noted, please. Thank you. This is Cosette Rechak speaking. Thank you, Cosette. Esme, can you note that, please? Yes, um, that's noted. Uh, A3, the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of November. Does anyone have any comments on this? Yes, I do. Um, I just, um, in, the, uh, in A3 of A3, yeah. um, the, oh. um, the issue that I raised was around the valuation uncertainty. Um, it's not the valuation of uncertainty. Uh, in the auditor's report and what was signed in the audit representation letter, not the audit report. Quite, and that slipped off our, it's got action there, but it's not highlighted and it's slipped off our action tracker. Yeah. Um, so, uh, who will be dealing with that? We don't have, presumably we don't have... Um, we did get a response, I think, at the time from the auditor to that query. We did? Yes. That, which was emailed through to us? No, I think it was actually at the meeting. Um, Esme, can we make a note to look at that? Was the response given in the meeting? I can't remember, I'm afraid. Um, and that action, if we can pop it on the action tracker, and and clear it. And then th there were there were two other actions. There was considering the ten uh, on A seven, considering the ten k limit for money laundering. I know we look at, look at money laundering policies again now, so we could yep. raise them. And then also on A nine, it was David Hughes to take account of the National Risk Register. Those were actions. Indeed, Chair. On on the latter, I'm happy that we'll, we'll bring back the um, reg risk register to the next uh, meeting of the committee. Um, so we have actually, at, as at EMT, Executive Management Team, Risk and Control Board, review the National Risk Register to highlight areas where we want to to amend the Strategic Risk Register. So that's been taken into account. Okay. okay thank you. So just note to Esme, if we can just make sure all of these go on the action tracker so that they can properly be, be answered and ticked off. Um, right, so if everyone's happy with that, they can be signed off. So we're moving on to A4, which is the forward program and action tracker. Does anyone have any comments on this? No comments. Um, um, Andrew speaking, Chairman. Yes, yeah. Um, so I still can't see you, so I'm slightly blind. But so this forward program, um, I don't know where I got, it, it seemed a bit thin. I I just wondered if had we decided that we wouldn't sort of include in this when we look at the risk register and um, mm. look at the auditor's report and internal audit work, etc. I don't know whether I am I looking at the latest version. It's it, it is only one one it's one page. It's got yeah. COVID nineteen update, then goes through to draft statements of accounts. Yeah. The statement of account. But 
so I think uh, uh, the principal thing I thought we would see sort of the audit cycle come into this when we have the audit plan, the audit report back, um, et cetera. Um, and then I was thinking about risk register. But what 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 was the um, what what was the, the what population are you aiming for on the forward program? So I was going to make a comment on this um, that I very much agree with you. It is thin, and if you refer to the um, the chair's annual report. Uh, what is that? Uh, A14, right at the end of this meeting. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's a hell of a lot we do that is not in that. Yeah. I, I guess that's what I'm saying. Indeed, yeah. Yeah. And and what's more is um, the details of what additional things we're planning on doing here um, in terms of the report on the COVID 19 crisis, the lessons learned, uh, cybersecurity, Grenfell, et cetera, et cetera. All this, this list really needs to be put onto this report. David, do you want to comment? Yeah, indeed, Chair. Thank you. So there are, as, as Mr Ling says, there are a number of standard reports which are, which we would normally have there. So I'll work with ESME between now and the next meeting to make sure we update and, and provide you with a comprehensive uh, forward plan so that we can circulate that before the next meeting. So, so the members of the committee can have the opportunity to comment on it. But there are a number of standard items which come either to all or most meetings which need to be out on there as well as the specific reports uh, such as COVID-19 update which you mentioned chair just a yeah. minute ago. I mean I think we need to, this needs to be our book of work yeah. um, for the year and we need to it needs to be obviously reviewed at every meeting and we need to build it up um, and whilst we're going through the meeting and Esme has taken the minutes in terms of the action tracker there also need to be we need to populate this this forward plan um, where we decide that actually we need a report on things are we happy with that yeah um in addition yeah i'll leave that to any other business but the the risk report is coming up in the next meeting isn't it david it is indeed chair it is indeed may i make a request that on that um, risk report. We look at whether we need to include the council's commitment to uh, net zero carbon emissions by 2030, um, because as as we are 18 months into that, um, and a lot of money needs to be spent in order to get us there. I think that's a that's a risk we need to be tracking. Um, you may already have it on your radar. It it certainly is, Chair. So that, that was added um, by EMT at the last meeting, so that will be coming to you uh, in, in terms of the next iteration of the risk register. Perfect. Great. Thank you very much. Esmo, there's quite a lot to take in there, but at least these meetings are recorded now, so you can play them back at your uh, in your own time to make sure you catch everything. Mr yeah. Chair. Uh, any other questions? Cosette, sorry. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to build upon the comments already made to make a distinction between the annual rhythm of a book of work, the things that will always be there, including standing items at every meeting, but also the usual annual rhythm of an external audit, for example. And then, of course, the space for specific matters as they arise. There should be a, a, a forward agenda that has both of those things. So would you recommend sort of splitting it, splitting it into two of, of? I think that there should be a, a generic forward agenda that's mapped to the meeting cycle that you have annually of X number of meetings a year, at which there will always be particular things that have to be done. So, for example, every September we might meet to approve the accounts. Yeah. So there will be certain things that have to be done every year, year in and year out. And we should know which meeting each year those things would take place. And then in addition to that, there will be ad hoc things that arise. And those two things together are the forward agenda. Yeah, I'm happy with that. Yeah, I think this is a good idea, yeah. Yep, yeah. can I make a suggestion, um, David and team, can you put together this forward agenda, yeah. um, this book of work um, of all the standing items and the additional items which you've included in the chairman's report 
And can you email it round to all the members? Um, yep. Because uh, I don't want to wait for the next committee to then sort of review it. Let's try no, and get ahead of this and get a, a really um, robust um, forward planner in place for the next meeting. Indeed, Chair, um, happy to do and, that. Yep. And it yep. gives Sorry. the committee members a, an opportunity to put in their suggestions. Indeed. Um, you know, looking at the skills matrix of a committee or discussion on how we can prove the annual financial statements um, in terms of their um, their ability to be read by the lay person, et cetera, which, which we've discussed before, but let's let's get them on the forward planner. Indeed, we'll do chair. Great, thank you. Well, we've got a busy meeting and it's starting busy already. So, right, A4 is done. Uh, uh, any further questions? No. So A5, um, uh, this is the Pro report. Um, I am going to hand over to Barry or Elizabeth to frame it. Okay, um, Barry, shall I shall I start and then certainly then if I do a sort of broad brushy approach. I, I think what we've really found here is uh, a proper thorough and independent investigation and certainly from our point of view as council we we agree with the founder of things and we acknowledge that you know Kroll found no wrongdoing but what before Barry even talks about that I'd just like to say the things that a report can't do and what it can't do is convey actually still the depth of feeling and mistrust that exists between the council and parts of our community today. So when someone was asking earlier, you know, why did, why did we do the, the, the Crow report in the first place? And I think it sort of came partly because conversations with the auditors, but partly because we had this legacy of distrust over property transactions and a, a real feeling in the community that, that, that the council hadn't listened to them and that perhaps th there was um, uh, wrongdoing. As I said, I think the, the report shows that there wasn't. Uh, however, this feeling of mistrust after Grenfell, it, it, the feelings are still very raw. And um, in a few months, you know, staff and councillors from this authority are going to face questions at the ongoing public inquiry. And I think we owe it to people who lost their lives and those who survived and their families to sort of be honest with them and honest with us. And those are the things that a, a report can't fix. Um, and nor is it something that time's just going to fix. Um, and that's what we're, we're, we're trying to do because we all have to sort of work on this together. And so I'd just like to say it's pretty clear to me that before 2017, that the council did not find the right balance between financial benefits and social benefits. And too often the council uh, placed a narrow goal of generating commercial income above the broader aim of delivering benefits to the wider community. And that's not to say that the council's policy wasn't without reason. You know, good services need funding and additional income can help meet tough financial challenges, which we and many other local councils face. Uh, however, those financial considerations should never come automatically first. And you know, you look at the Kroll report, we fell below the bar on consultation, on transparency, on scrutiny, and on policy. And we can't say hand on heart that our residents were involved every step of the way because patently they weren't. Nor can we say that the council put their interests first and foremost. And for that, you know, I have apologized and we as a council we should all apologise for that. So in short, I'd say that no wrongdoing doesn't necessarily mean you get everything right. And uh, the, the point of this call report is for us to jump from this, to look to the future and to continue to shift our focus. So wherever possible, we put social value and community interests first beyond property in all we do. And that's why you'll see the recommendations in uh, Barry's report, which is saying things like you know, we need to look at social investment, we need to look at how officers write reports, we need to look at how we scrutinise things, and we need to ensure that we do put our communities first in everything we do. 
Uh, Barry, do you want to, to pick up from, from me now? Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, and uh, thank you to the committee for um, uh, considering. And I apologise for the length of the reports, um, but I think that you'll, um, you'll see from reading them that uh, it required this length of investigation. Uh, the, this is a painstaking and forensic independent audit examination of key property transactions conducted before 2017. And uh, Kroll examined these issues in depth and they produced a report of their findings. That report's included in this agenda. Um, uh, the process for their report's inquiries is set out in paragraph two of um, uh, the covering report from myself and David Hughes. And our report draws from the findings of Kroll and suggests a number of recommendations for the Council to take things forward. And they're set out in paragraph five. Now, paragraph six to 15 inclusive give the underlying of our covering report, give the underlying reasoning as to why this audit was required. It was prompted by the October 2018 publication uh, by Kensington and Chelsea College of Kroll's original report into the council's purchase of the college site in 2016, two years earlier. Um, following the publication of that Kroll report in October 2018, I had discussions with the council's external auditors. Immediately, I received that report. Uh, Grant Thornton, that is our external auditors, to, to discuss with them whether they felt that the strength of the findings of that report um, into their sale of that property to us meant that we ought to examine our purchase of that property. Um, at the same time, of course, there were uh, very strong Save the Warnington College community campaign groups. There were issues about this being part of, as uh, the leader has just said, a legacy of mistrust um, uh, in relation to Grenfell. And therefore, we had discussions with the community cam campaign groups as well as other uh, Grenfell legacy um, uh, bereaved and survivors about this. And the, it was the view of the um, independent community groups and the strong view of the external auditor that we needed really to do an independent investigation. After all, in 2016, we bought the college for 25.35 million. And just three years later in 2019, we sold it to the Department for Education for 10 million. Um, and at the time it was valued at 22 million. And we did that because we got had to get permission from the Secretary of State, um, uh, from one Secretary of State, which is MHCLG, in order that we could sell the property to the DFE, in order that they could then invest in the college, such that we could become a thriving college. And of course, now, as since then, has merged with Morley College, uh, who have uh, great plans and ideas for uh, reviving and improving. Uh, the scheme. So this was not a trivial uh, sum, nor was it a trivial issue. It was a very significant issue in the community, and it was a significant issue for the council in restoring, as uh, the leader has said, the question of trust in our dealings with the uh, with the public, and particularly in relation to our policy. Now, the core findings of the Crow report are that the council's then property policy was rational in its own terms and that there was no wrongdoing, as the leader has said. However, the specific decisions that were examined and I would say the advice on which these, these decisions were made did not arise from a thoroughgoing evaluation of all possible options, nor did they rest on a, what one would actually consider a proper consideration of all the relevant factors. Um, uh, from 2010 to 2017, as the report sets out, local government spending was subject to heavy constraints and budget reductions. In London, spending plummeted by one third across all London authorities and in ours as well. Many councils simply cut their service standards and cut their services. And by contrast, this council had the benefit of discretionary income. Obviously, it did also make 
reductions in expenditure in some of its core uh, public good services. Um, but not only do we have the benefit of discretionary income, what's more, prime London asset values and demands for rentals remain strong in central and West London, particularly in Westminster and in Kensington and Chelsea, compared to, to the position across the capital. So the combined impact of the four property transactions gained the council some 4.2 million in commercial rental income, which supported, among other things, children's social care spending, a genuinely positive outcome. And although the approach to gaining rental outcome was too narrowly drawn and failed to take account of wider considerations, we must bear in mind the fact that this supported the council's revenue budget. Now, paragraphs 42 to 49 describe the basis for professional advice giving and decision making by councillors. And whenever we're doing an audit into decision making, we're actually looking at what was the advice given on which the decisions were predicated. In local government, decisions are made on the basis of professional advice, whether that's service based advice, property based, financial or legal. And the growing picture amongst councils uh, is that this advice needs to be much better coordinated, more coherent and with imp imp uh, improved corporate inputs from the whole council, rather than simply looking through single domain professional silos. That occurs in every aspect of the council's work, not just in property. So at the start of 2010, the council had 10 million in rental income. At one point, it aimed to double this to 20 million at the suggestion of uh, the corporate property director at the time, who said that this was feasible. But by the end of 2020, the actual figure had risen to 16 million. Um, uh, and all these asset strategies were intended to support the council's aims, not to be ends in their own right. Now, the first order question for us as a council is, are we making sure that we achieve best value in everything we do? This involves balancing economic, social and environmental goals and objectives. And the government's statutory guidance on best value, which was reissued in March 2015, which took out some of the requirements uh, the local authorities had at the time, but added others, um, actually says that councils are under a general duty of best value to make arrangements to secure continuous improvement in the way in which its functions are exercised, having regard to a combination of economy, efficiency and effectiveness. And it says under the duty of best value, therefore, authorities should consider overall value, including economic, environmental and social, when reviewing service provision goes on to say this is a duty, this is not optional. So the first order question when we're looking at all service reconfiguration, including asset based reconfiguration, is are we, are we achieving best value? Are we balancing properly and appropriately economic, environmental and social considerations? Not are we uh, just deciding on a solution and saying this is a, um, uh, a rational approach to, to uh, revenue maximisation, which undoubtedly it was and, and is. Um, the second order question is then how do our resourcing and service strategies align with the council plan and the policy priorities that flow from that? And then the third order question is about how we connect our asset strategy and our human resources strategy and so on to align to these broader policy objectives. And specifically in respect of assets, we're looking at reshaping, at renting, at selling or transferring an asset. The issue is how do the council have regard to best consideration, which may seem, sound the same as best value, but it's fundamentally uh, different. So according to Kroll, uh, on page 38 of their report, they say, while the focus on revenue maximisation may have appeared to be the sole focus, the overall objective was, according to the documents that they reviewed, to benefit the community as a whole. And there's no question about that in relation to it supporting um, the spending of the authority. That's the correct description. But while having an overall resourcing strategy based on revenue maximisation for rental income was financially sound, as the leader has said, it was perhaps too narrowly cast. And in particular, it wasn't 
didn't have any consideration of social or community considerations at all, nor of equality's impact consideration and so on. And it did not have consideration of those matters which have driven the council's work since the Grenfell tragedy. And so that's why I've drawn these six recommendations that are in paragraph five, um, which are about ensuring that the whole organisation learns from this exercise, that the executive director for housing and social investment brings a report on to the leadership team and for the council, a new approach to social value, social investment and community benefit, which balances these factors with asset and property management, broader service delivery and financial matters. And that we also look at the issue of assets of community value, um, which was actually introduced in the early 2010s. Um, and it is about the uh, consideration, how we consider proposals for uh, assets of community value to be um, nominated, one to be nominated, then to be assigned, and then what happens in respect of that. And the government has just recently, as you'll found in the last week uh, in the budget, uh, established a, um, a resource for communities to bid in order that they can um, more easily uh, procure assets of community value rather than just resource them themselves. And so uh, power, uh, recommendation 5.4 says that actually we need open engagement with potentially impacted communities to proceed our formal decision making process, not to follow on from it. And that's the case in the Charter for Public Participation that we've signed up to. And it's the commitments we've made as a council to embedding this charter in our work. And so I've uh, task the Director of Audit, Fraud, Risk and Insurance and the Council's Monitoring Officer, who's responsible for, for propriety of decision making to make sure that the advice that we give um, is rounded, objective, impartial and balanced. And that means that we need an exercise with our um, report authors and our directors and executive directors about the ad appropriateness and adequacy of officer drafted reports so that we are looking at things much more in the round from a corporate perspective even if uh, the solution to a particular problem seems blindingly obvious we do need to have make sure that we go through thorough uh, impartial option appraisals and so on so that those are the recommendations that um, both David Hughes and I feel are appropriate to um, draw from the findings of the Kroll report and I'll leave that as my introduction to you. Thank you very much Barry and Elizabeth. Um, before we go into uh, questions I wonder if our external, external auditors have got anything to say on this. Is, is Paul Grady on the line? Yeah chucked him under the bus here because I haven't informed him. Yeah. If, he's not on, if he's not on the line. Oh, there he is. There he is. He's there there. he is. Paul, I'm very sorry for not warning you, but not you were mentioned in there. Um, would you like to offer a few comments on this? Sure. Um, so as, as Barry says, at, um, throughout the process at the front end and also uh, as the conclusions were coming through, um, we, we were fully involved in, and um, I think the council's the council's approach as a whole um, felt very appropriate to us. I think the the decision to go ahead with the report um, absolutely made sense, uh, and the um, the the findings of the report. I think whilst clearly there's there's some lessons to be learned, um, there was uh, there was nothing overall in the report taken as a whole in terms of the, of the conduct of our audit, um, which which gave us undue cause for concern. Um, given the measures that we know are in place, given what we've discussed with the council with our wider value for money work over the past few years, and given what we've been able to trace in terms of the, the council's own recognition in terms of attitudes and approach to, to things like this um, and how those are changing and, and the wider cultural change agenda. Um, the findings of the report were clearly are in line and being taken into account by the council and by management within that wider context uh, in terms of the way the way forward. So I think it was uh, as a process, it felt um, from our perspective as external audit, it, it felt right to, to, to go through this process, notwithstanding the, 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 the size of, of, of the review. Um, 
Uh, and it, and it, it felt like an appropriate, uh, the, the council's response to it is, is appropriate in terms of it being added to the pot of uh, learning uh, learning elements, which, which the council um, is keen to take on board as it continues to develop and uh, transform culture and processes and practices uh, to date and going forward. Thank you very much. Um, now, what I'm proposing is um, we'll now have a round of, of questions um, from members. Um, and just to sort of highlight there so that they are questions, not speeches. Um, so if we can keep them succinct and uh, questioning. Um, and then what we're being asked to do in this report is really agree whether we agree with the recommendations and agree to them. Um, and then refer them on to the other committees um, and suggest any other recommendations we would like in there. So if, if you can bear that in mind once we've had all the questions and, and answers um, so that we could we could offer some advice as to how we could improve this report or whether we're happy with the recommendations as they stand. Uh, so now I will try and go in order of the people who put up their hands and I think it's uh, Emma Dencode first and foremost put up her hand. Um, so I'll hand over to you, Emma. Thank you very much, Chair. And we just had half an hour of a positive spin on this report. Um, it's hardly fair to expect me just to come up with um, three questions. Um, so I, I'm just going to speak very briefly, as briefly as I can bear, because uh, we will be um, having a full response on this. Um, I, 165 pages, which I read over and over again in utter disbelief. Um, um, and I'm sorry that you're all so distanced from the effects of, of, these, um, of these contracts at the time. Because myself and Council Blake will have a completely different view of it. And, and OK, Kroll think there was no wrongdoing. Um, there may not be criminal wrongdoing, Chair, but I'm just going to focus on five specific points where we failed and we are still failing. And I think that's really the, the best thing that I can do in, in a brief time. Um, firstly, you know, uh, um, it's been nearly four years since Grenfell. I don't want to hear that phrase, lessons learned anymore. I want to hear what people are doing. I've really had enough of this. We don't need to be told over and over again how badly things are doing. Um, and um, we are still not getting, the council is still not um, transparent. I'm desperately trying to get a financial background to one of the, um, the new homes um, um, deals that they're doing and and, and officers and um, the the um, lead member won't won't share it so how, how are we supposed to comment on that how are we supposed to honestly honestly consult with the um, with um, our residents and with councillors thank god we're being included this time if all the documents aren't shared and that comes up over and over again in the report that the documents weren't shared with councillors sometimes not even with the chairs of the relevant committee so that's one thing share documents which are relevant um, and um, so yeah um, yes it comes up again in the report and this was in um, the first crawl report as well about the governance over disposal and acquisitions when are we going to actually um, have some some clarity on when and where the council is allowed to dis dispose of things or, or acquire things because it's happening on the quiet that we believe on, with council homes but we don't know because it's not done openly so that's another thing and that is actually in the in um, the audit report um, a little bit later um yeah the other issue is and again we, we are still coming up against this that there are actions against the that what was then the core strategy now our local plan and even spds and local policy and so on on, um, on on development and on deals and again we're facing that with one of our uh, new homes program that oh no you know this is the SPD but that was done years ago and no 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 I'm sorry we spent hours we sweated blood over that we have to stick to our local plan and our supplementary planning documents and we're not doing it and um, the uh, policy CK1 which is social and community use comes up I don't know how many times in this report that the council circumvented it to do what they wanted. So I'm, um, you know, we, we have to really focus on that. And again, this is something which is still an issue and it's not, you know, it's not good enough. Um, numerous times it's come up that there was scrutiny after the decision was made. Uh, one of our chairs, one of our Labour chairs is chasing a report. He's been told he'll get it the day before his committee. That's not good enough. 
uh, because you have to give people enough time. If we're trying to improve our scrutiny, which is what we all want, reports must be written on time. Um, yep. And where are we? Yes, the, um, my final point, really. Um, <laughs> while, um, and it comes up in, um, it comes up in this report that, um, about the, um, the, the, uh, quantity, the underspends while, while we were squeezing our assets to get another million pounds here, there and everywhere. Um, and I'm trying not to be political about of this, uh, but, um, we know what local people thought was happening, that they were going to be squeezed out. But while we were doing that, to squeeze out a few million pounds here and there, there were underspends between 2010 and 16 of over 90 million pounds. Now, why wasn't that money used for the services that we were so afraid that, that we wanted to bolster? Why wasn't that <laughs> about? And this is something definitely for Audit Transparency Chair. I know the, the whole issue of underspends has been above there for years, underspends in revenue, um, going into capital reserves we've talked about that but this this happened and we really have to you really have to focus on this and finally <clears throat> in those six years um one of the issues that should have been dealt with was economic well-being in the, <clears throat> in the north of the borough um and one of the uh, reasons excuses whatever you want to call it for buying the um, college and um, developing it was and this is i quote the economic area of their well-being of the area will be improved and it clearly would not have been goldborn ward is still one of the poorest wards in london and kensal town is the poorest bit of the poorest ward in the whole of london shame on us after all these years squeezing assets here and there um we are not putting it into into tackling poverty and i find that so shameful a lot of people out there do too can we please please chair somehow get into this get into our response the fact that when we have money we have to target it in the areas of worst inequality we're still not doing it it's in our local plan and we should do that we need to we need to prioritize that because it's getting worse we've got 23 food banks um i'll leave that there and uh, as i said we will get a formal response um from the labor group and, and judith i'm sure will um will come up with some things that i've missed you know, this isn't that in the past I've picked up on things that we're still doing now, we're still failing now, and, and we have to look at. And I, I really, if I see another pastel bar chart, I'm really sorry, Mr. Crook, it, they drive me insane because because half our group are up there feeding people in food banks, and that really upsets me. So much time is spent on, on reports. And we're not actually dealing with poverty. So I'll finish there, sorry. Thank you very much. Um... So I'm just thinking about what you said and, and how you'd like to improve the recommendations that um, the CEO has put forward. Yeah. Um, so obviously one, one, the sort of, what can we do about the sharing of documents and transparency? Um, what properties we can and can't sell? Um, the timeliness of reports for scrutiny. Um, and and probably just a general scrutiny in yeah in and general that, 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 and sorry ck1 which is social and community use we're not we're not saving our assets we're not saving our community assets at the moment we're not doing we need to step up with that because people really need them okay um underspends i think probably doesn't fall under this but but it's, it's something that we would like to look at as a committee as you say we've looked at the reserves before um and perhaps david can take note of that and taryn that we can regularly review that um and then economic well-being for the poorest um again probably doesn't fall under this committee if you'd agree but but i'm sure it's it's a valid point um would you like particular answers to any of those now from elizabeth or baron I could certainly um, uh, say that in respect of the um, information, the governance you, you described of disposals and acquisitions, that is something that we um, uh, that we should, uh, if if we 
if you're finding difficulty with that, this, this should be a regular monitoring report on disposal acquisitions in relation to um, any of our assets. So I, I shall certainly look at that. Um, the issues about variations in the SPD or the local plan, um, any variation really can only be done with good, with good and explicit reason. So I'd like to again take away that to, to, to look at those areas where you put which you pointed to um, in respect of there not being uh, you're saying you know there's there's no good reason there's no, no um, uh, uh, any any warrants warranted variation from the from the agreed um, local plan that that should not be the case so I, I will again if if I can get have some examples of that I will certainly look into it in relation to scrutiny um, scrutiny there is both um, uh, what we're looking for here is some elements um, of pre-decision scrutiny um, as well as post-decision scrutiny um, and what we need to make sure of is that is that scrutiny is is empowered to be as effective as it can uh, in questioning and holding the executive to account um, that can only be done uh, before, but also after uh, the decisions are made. And in relation to underspends, um, since uh, I've been in the authority, I instituted a sort of monthly um, monitoring of expenditure. Uh, we do this in our executive management team every month, going through detail, you know, much higher levels of detail, monitoring of expenditure to make sure that we are ahead of, uh, we're managing the budget, not just watching the spend. Uh, the important thing is that uh, there's active management of, uh, of budgets that, that forecast uh, spend is properly forecast and expenditure is tracked against budget. But I will make. I could do a get a report uh, for the committee to demonstrate how that how we do that and how that's improved matters. Chair, I wonder if I might just jump in. This is um, Dan Hawthorne, Exec Director for Housing and Social Investment, just specifically on the property disposals point, which Councillor Denko raised. Right. Yep. The um, the we're bringing the housing uh, asset management strategy to leadership team. I believe later this month, and, exactly. and that and that will cover. Um, that question as it relates to housing assets, and we are also working on an asset management strategy for the council more for the council's assets more broadly, including of course all the general fund assets, which we hope to bring to leadership team later this year. And I think between those two policies, we should have some kind of clarity and transparency, if you like, on the council's kind of new approach to disposals as informed by, among other things, um, this report. Brilliant. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, because actually I was just about to come in and say perhaps we ought to have Dan in here to talk exactly about that in relation to your first question. I, I think the other thing I'd like to say um, is that, of course, we did put in uh, changes in governance and scrutiny, et cetera. And at the moment, we have got the Centre for Public Scrutiny looking exactly at that, you know, how it's working, what's working well, what's not, et cetera. And I think they've had one informal report which I haven't yet seen and then there's another report which will all come to the council meeting in July. Thank you. Um, right moving on to other questions uh, Andrew Ling was next up on my list. Okay well uh, thank you chairman. Um, so firstly thank you Barry, thank you for Elizabeth for coming to the meeting and framing this um, because um, we don't know each other well. I haven't met you, Elizabeth. I think I've met you once, Barry. Um, but I, I've been on the audit committee for 15 years, and this probably sort of ranks in the top five issues that have come across my 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 radar as a me member of the audit committee. Um, so the first thing I think it's an important thing. I, I would just make a statement that I'm surprised that this has only really surfaced at this stage. So a question is, yes, the external auditors were involved. We as an audit committee have private sessions with external auditors. Why was something as important as this not actually just mentioned um, in a private or public session? It, it hadn't been. So I think that's not good. Um, I like the way, Elizabeth, that you framed this. Um, I understood it. it was pithy. It kind of said, yes, we've got it. We know we've got to change. 
I then read 10 pages, which seem a lot about process and recommendations, but I kind of agree with some of the points that Emma's saying that I wonder if there is really the change that one would expect from this. Is that change evidence? Um, and that's the second, well, this, I suppose the executive summary of 10 plus pages. One, it doesn't seem to be an executive summary. And second, to me, but possibly first, it doesn't make that very pithy point that in the past, there was the wrong balance achieved between financial benefit and social benefit. And whilst I think you were careful, Elizabeth, to say and Barry about Kroll, who are, they're, they're, they're forensic people, they look very much at detail, which is good, but you can, I think, start to not um, realise what the elephant in the room is by the time you get to the level of detail that they've looked at it. So I'd kind of like to see that perhaps the response to this particular issue more looked at it from the top down and really did grasp the point that it was there were there were things that were wrong and there are important things that have got to change. Having said all that, this is a hugely complex issue and so sound bites are not going to solve it. But I think that if I as an outside member of the group, I a co-opted member with no involvement in the council, there is a little bit too much of a feeling of defensive play in the response um, and I kind of see this as quite typical of a number of reports I've seen over the years where there has been a problem you then dive so far into the detail and that phrase lessons learned comes out a lot that you 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 you, you actually lose your focus and lose perhaps some of your determination to correct things so um, I just bring to this a lot of experience of audit committees um, work in big organisations. I th just think that if this internal report is perhaps a representation of how the matter is being dealt with internally, there's a little too much of focusing on process, not enough focusing on what was the real problem at play here, which is, I guess, has been revealed only because of Brenville. So they are observations. I don't know enough to make uh, challenges on particular points of detail. Um, I would ask the chair and, uh, and others, what are you really looking for from the audit committee? Well, my primary objective is to give everyone the ability to ask questions and discuss this, but the primary objective is, do we agree with these recommendations? And is there, are there any recommendations that we suggest we add to them? Mm -hmm. um, so I think on your point, Andrew, one of them would be we have to have an annual report to the Audit and Transparency Committee on, um, you know, from, from sort of David Hughes, really on, I suppose, on best value, um, which, which is slightly sort of alluded to in here on, on recommendation five. But I think we need the report coming to the committee on that would you agree well, well i think it's yeah a report would be helpful but i think it is actually lack of detection there was a problem so what recommendation could we put in uh well i, I think others are necessarily being silent but this is about cultural change and sometimes it's difficult to devise rules that will lead to the cultural change one wants to achieve yeah. and it does take a long time i will just say the obvious to every everybody this is something that wasn't on the audit committee radar it should have been um you've got to get an organization working such that you know, these things such things in the future will appear and it's not necessarily because you put rules in place but you've got people who've got the right will and common objectives etc um, so I can't think of what particularly we can say the internal auditor needs to I would say to the current external auditors let's be a little bit bolder about what we report to what is a very senior scrutiny committee tip them off that's a very good point um Yes, there's no me mention in the recommendations of the use of the external auditors in helping uncover these. Barry, maybe you could apply your mind 
Yes, um, I mean, I, first of all, I'd like to say I'd like to thank um, Andrew for those observations. Oh, I understand them. Uh, and um, uh, I think that all I would say is um, it's very I've been involved since I've been here in trying to uh, to sustain what uh, to trigger the momentum for significant cultural change in the organization. What I didn't want to do is to describe this in those terms uh, because I wanted to faithfully report what was an investigation about what happened um, on these transactions several years ago. I didn't want to, in a sense, smother that with, and these are how we've uh, changed things since then. Um, uh, however, what you say is absolutely right, and it actually echoes what Paul Grady himself said. He talked about the wider cultural change agenda um, right. in respect of, of this report. And I see this as being um, an important tool for me to increase the pressure within the organisation for greater corporacy, for much better advice giving. And by that, I mean not service based silos um, where solutions are identified by professionals straight off or, or politicians come to that uh, and that we look at things in the round and that we have proper advice giving from lit a range of perspectives and that advice giving is predicated on achieving social and community benefit. Um, we're here to in, in, essentially to uh, forward the public interest uh, and that I think is the culture change that we're looking for and if we can use our approach on audit to uh, further that, which is what David and I do when we're looking all the time at how we manage risk and how we how we can report on uh, what we're doing as a management uh, group. Then I think that will be that will be a really positive thing. So further reports here annually about how we're changing as an organisation, um, so that audits has a perspective about organisational change, and audit can criticise and critique what we're doing on what that would be powerful. I think. Um, so we're adding another recommendation there, Barry. Were you, were you happy with that? Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. Sorry, Elizabeth. Uh, yeah, I, I was going to pick up on what Andrew's saying about cultural change. I, I suppose I see it. I, I, what I was saying earlier, this report is, is almost too narrow to capture where we've got to on cultural change and where we're going with it. And quite often we talk to people about a legacy from Grenfell and 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 that really means a really putting communities first and really talking to them before we do anything. And I and I look at what my um, deputy leader Kim is doing with the TCC, the Tennyson Consultative Committee, where you know, it's, he's really got a, a group of residents who come together, maybe 70, who really, really talk through the options before anything goes forward. So I think, you know, should you should this committee wish to have examples of, of how we have changed and how we want to continue to change, they are there. So it's not just a question of us trotting along and saying, oh, yes, well, you know, there are lessons to be learned and we will do it. I think we've all already changed and there are tangible examples that we can give you of the change um, but of course that doesn't necessarily mean that it stops here and that well, there's not a lot more to do well thank you elizabeth I, my my last comment and then i've had my fair share of say is probably um i, I may be looking at this more as a uh, it, much broader than perhaps just a, a member of the audit committee it's a bit more of how you talk which comes through to from through to the recommendations than um validation of the process um, um which comes through quite strongly i think in the 10 plus pages so it may be that it's it's rising up above this rather sort of technical uh, narrowly yeah. based technical exercise um which i'm probably looking for but that may come out in other forums um uh, but i just sense my gut feeling is there needs to be more of that yeah yeah and if i may i think it's, it's probably fair to say that andrew's also saying that he like um having you attend the committee elizabeth and barry um and so 
by seeing more of you in the committee, then the co-opted and independent members are going to be able to yeah. have a better handle on the on the culture. Get a better flavour, right? That, that exactly, that, that you are embarking on. It's very difficult for the councillors on it because we we live it and hear it in the council chamber, etc. Um, but but they are obviously slightly removed. Yeah, thank you for making that point, um, Ian. Um, now, in terms of questions, uh, first I've got Councillor Williams, then I've got Cosette, and then I've got Councillor Blakeman. So I'm going to take them in those order. Councillor Williams, uh, please. Um, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm looking at this very much from the point of view of the control environment today, and I find myself um, in agreement with Councillor Dent Code on the question of scrutiny, because I see scrutiny is a very important part of the control environment. Uh, I think in anything to do with property disposals, uh, post-decision scrutiny will be of limited value. Uh, it's important we have effective pre-decision scrutiny, and we have to look, and this is for other people in other places, at whether our um, scrutiny arrangements are sufficiently flexible and fleet of foot. Um, I would also uh, say that on the uh, recommendations in Barry's um, paragraph five, I, to be honest, I have some difficulty in sort of really understanding what it will look like. Um, and I think certainly it should come back to this committee to see it, look at it from a control point of view. Um, and I'd also ask him if he can uh, point to examples of other councils which are uh, he thinks are do, uh, doing it well um, and that we could look at uh, look at what, what their policies are uh, and learn from them. Thank you. Uh, can I just jump in and say just on the scrutiny, Charles, as I said, you know, we put in the new processes in place in 2019 and uh, the Centre for Public Scrutiny is in at the moment going through everything with a tooth comb and will make recommendations to us to the full council in July as whether we need to tweak things or whether they're fine or you know wherever we are so I'd quite like to wait until we've got those recommendations before I come back to you or this committee rather <laughs> Barry over to you about the other uh, I wonder if 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 David Hughes has a view on this point about internal control environment and the role of uh, over and scrutiny in respect of that and or this committee so i think i think barry very much and chair in terms of the managing risk i think it's very important for the committee to be able to focus on the control environment that's in place and that's something we can do and the work i can do with the monitoring officer in terms of reviewing um the way in which decision reports are put forward going forward we can incorporate um so i think it's very much for this committee to look at the way in which the risks around decision making are being managed Hmm. This is a, a dispersed, um, a, a, an approach which is dispersed with lots of different authors and lots of layers inevitably leads to loss of control. You must, um, or less control. Uh, I had 16 years working in a uh, directly elected mayor model. I also had uh, eight years working in the committee model. Um, and there are different models of governance and controls that have, in my view, to reflect and reinforce the governance of the authority. Um, so I can look at a mayoral model in some authorities, in Hackney, for example, uh, strong controls. I can look at another one, which actually has quite weak controls in a mayoral model. So, um, but with a leader and cabinet system, with and then you have to look at leader and cabinet systems with um, uh, majority in overview and scrutiny uh, as opposed to minority in overview and scrutiny which is, it, so it depends on where the can where the political control is exercised constitutionally mm. through the council um, but i do think we need to um, tighten up uh, our corporacy uh, i still see um, uh, a number of reports that come from a particular domain and they go straight into the uh, executive arrangements and really they need to have uh, advice much more on finance, uh, on the legal, on the uh, legal uh, implications, 
uh, have regard to things like public sector equality duty and so on. Um, uh, these issues uh, are so important and it's been those authorities that have made more reductions in the last few years have learned this because they've been caught and tripped up by not being able to implement their schemes simply because they haven't made the decisions properly uh, and the advice hasn't come to them from a, on a corporate basis. So we need um, to make sure that our advice giving is as thorough as it possibly can be. Um, that's really important and it's not just um, offering the advice that's required. Mm. Okay, thank you, Barry. Uh, just moving on quickly through the rest of the questions, Cazette. Thank you, Chair. Just briefly, I wanted to touch upon this consideration of the social aspect and how critical it is that this be done soon enough to be a factor in the decision taking alongside all of the other ones. And with regard to bringing this to the Audit and Transparency Committee or any other management or committee form that there may be, what I think would be quite helpful is if there is written evidence of precisely how the community was engaged with and how the social considerations were gathered and how they were factored in to the ultimate decision that was getting made. There needs to be specific evidence that that's happening before the decision gets taken. Yeah. That was all I wanted to say. Yeah. Okay. And can I say actually at the leadership team meetings, you one of the, the first questions anyone asks is who has been consulted? Who has been consulted on this? What is evidence of it? You know, et cetera. So that is something that we do take very seriously. And it is something that we do ask every single time. But if I come back to the ones on the housing and social investment, I think the policy, as Dan said, the policy is going to be ready. Is it before the summer, Dan, that you're working on it? So Dan, for, the, for the housing uh, asset management strategy, we're, yeah. we're expecting to bring that. I think I think that's coming to the leadership team in March, this month's meeting. Um, for the wider asset management across all the journal fund assets, that will take a bit longer. I think, I think we're expecting that by the end of this year. But what we're also doing, um, and this is the direct response to uh, one of the recommendations in the recovering report, I think it's recommendation 5.2, is we've got um, uh, our first leadership team report on our on progress with the with the social investment approach, which is which is scheduled for leadership team in May, which will describe how we are um, kind of structurally building in those those social value elements into uh, not only property decisions but also um, some other work in other fields as well including housing so that so that it'll be it'll be covered in a number of things in a way the, the range of different decisions that, ha that that will cover this over the course of this year illustrates the kind of the extent to which this ethos is beginning to permeate as it were the, certainly the work across not just my directorate but but across the wider council as a whole, I mean, I'm, I'm, it, it, it's still relatively early stages work, but it does show the kind of diversity of the of the fields in which we're now beginning to apply these principles. That all sounds really encouraging, and the committee looks forward to hearing more about it in due course. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Um, Councillor Judith Blakeman. Um, yeah, thank you, Chair. I've got uh, probably too much to say, so I won't say it all. But um, you, you said a lot about consultation but without actually saying what consultation is and what it means and how it should be carried out. And I think that is a, a huge um, gap in what's said here. Um, I don't quite see how this report can be said to deal with the lack of trust within North Kensington because it only deals with a tiny element mm, of mm. the whole problem mm. <clears throat> that was around the property strategy. I mean, it started off with the Latin and master plan. It developed into a scorched earth policy for the Silchester estate and people are still very much licking their wounds over that. Um, and it's evolved into the housing issues and um, well, as far as scrutiny is concerned, I don't know if anyone has watched the last Families Select Committee, but um, 
all sorts of questions that were asked about funding were just not answered. And I, I've been inundated with emails afterwards from people who were at it saying, well, what can we do? How will we find out this information? And it's just not available. I mean, I could, uh, there's a lot more I could say about it, but as uh, <coughs> Councillor Dent Code says, we will be sending our own comments on this whole report shortly. Great, thank you. Well, uh, Barry, may, I, may I just say uh, one, a uh, couple of things related to that. First of all, thank you. I look forward to re receiving that because I do think it's your in-depth knowledge of the locality that adds colour to what is a, a, um, a boring process dominated uh, report, which I you know, can only apologise for, but it, it actually is about what can we draw from this in-depth examination for as general lessons and in 5.4 um, I do say that we need open engagement with all potentially impacted communities preceding formal decision making processes because we have agreed a charter of public participation and it is the pu public participation and the the authority if I might say is very good at service user consultation but it doesn't have a track record in the last uh, certainly, certainly in, the, in the seven years between 2010 and 2017 of community based consultation, which is different. You're not engaging service users. You're not asking library users. What are they? How can they get better use of the library or people with learning difficulties about how better to de de develop services for them or children um, who are looked after about how to engage them in those areas? We are I think we've got some excellent practice in service user consultation. What we didn't have is broader community consultation with with the breadth of communities who are impacted by public good changes, whether those are environmental, uh, common good services or uh, other common good facilities like public assets and community infrastructure. And what we're saying is we, we, we are um, resolved to improve on that. We have tried to uh, make improvements on that. It's been severely challenged because of the operating circumstances of the past year. But I do feel that this is the area that we should focus on. And I'm using this report to try to redouble the efforts in, in making that part of the um, organisational DNA. Thank you. Sorry, Chair, can I just say one thing very briefly, uh, very briefly, and I, and I don't want to disrespect Mr. Quirk, I know he's coming into this, this job with good faith, but what you said just a, a moment ago, Mr. Quirk, I found so deeply depressing. You said that community consultation adds colour and that our input adds colour, and I'm sorry, <laughs> Consultation should start with people. You don't just do a, whatever you think you're going to do yes, no. and add a bit of local colour. And that was really unfortunate. I'm sure that's not what you meant, no. but it came across really badly. Please, please don't say that anywhere in public because that is bordering on offensive. And that, I mean, if that's your mindset, so, you know, please, no. please have a read. Uh no, I, I apologise. I, 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 if that's what I said, that's not what I meant. What I, what I meant was that the input from the, I was looking forward to the report that you were producing because that would certainly add colour. I didn't mean that community itself, the input from communities was the input, from, the, the community, the council is a vehicle for self-governance. Uh, the community is not a byproduct. It's not a, um, um, yeah. a, a means. It's actually the ends, the purpose of why we're in this business. Great. Thank you, Barry. It's back to defining what you mean by consultation and what you intend to do with it. Because, I mean, we've been going on for years and years and years that you have never consulted communities. And consequently, this huge distrust has emerged. And this, this mm. whole snapshot of, of the whole property process that actually led directly mm. to the painful tragedy thank, uh, thank really you. needs to be dealt with. Um, thank you. Just in the interest of time, before we sort of veer off and onto sort of more political areas, um, you know, I, I hope everyone thought that was a, a good and worthwhile discussion.
uh, we need to agree now as a committee, do we agree to those recommendations um, and then refer it on to the leadership team and the over and scrutiny team? Ian? Yeah? Can I just ask a question? I don't know whether I've been forgotten or not. Oh, I haven't seen your hand. Where are you, David? Right, so it's quite difficult to see people's hands on here. Sorry, do you have no, your hand up? It's a very quick one. Um, I know because I've been on the website that the report is clearly available on the website, but are we making as sufficient a virtue out of necessity given the importance of being transparent? Uh, I don't understand what you mean by that. Yeah, no, I just want, no. clearly we clearly it is on the, the website so people yep. can see. Yes. But how many people have actually seen it and have we told have we um and there are clearly a number of people in the north of the borough who are distinctly distrustful towards the council have we let them know about it for example should we we've, we've certainly been talk, we certainly talked to journalists there was an article in the guardian about it um we've done things with trade mags and things i don't know whether i Right off the top of my head, I don't know whether it was in uh, the mag which goes to North Ken. Um, no, it wasn't. We can certainly get you that information. You can spend all that money. I'm sorry, Liz, but you're spending all that money on that on that funny little magazine, and you don't put in something which is really important. Well, so, hold on, so this is me, Emma. I didn't say whether we had or not. I said I, I didn't know off the top of my head whether we had, yeah. um, but we had certainly publicised it widely with you know any journalists who who came to us. I don't know. Anyone else here can answer that? No, I don't. Yeah, know. I mean, this whole report came from the left field. I mean, it was a huge shock. I mean, it was interesting to read, and I haven't actually quite finished reading it yet. But, um, you know, I mean, residents don't know anything about it. And I have tried to encourage a few residents to watch this meeting, but whether they will or not is another matter. Right. Mm -hmm. Barry, mm -hmm. may I leave mm -hmm. that with yeah, you? Yes, certainly. In terms of how we could um, uh, increase the transparency on this report and uh, ensure that it is more widely available, uh, probably with with a sort of a covering note from Elizabeth as well. Um, thinking about Andrew Ling's comments on yes. the culture and everything like that. Um, I think it's 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 a fair point. We've spent several hundred thousand on this report. Um, uh, to, not to repeat the we've learned lessons from it, but we've learned lessons from it. Um, and I think we need to we need to try and get a bit more there. Um, so please can we mm. leave with you. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, in terms of the recommendations, is everybody happy with the recommendations as they are? Um, obviously, we have suggested a recommendation to firm up that with the uh, Audit Transparency Committee will get a report from internal audit, which I think will sort of tie in nicely with where are we 5.5, um, the recommendation. Um, so if, perhaps if we could slot it in there, Barry. Certainly. Can we also have a discussion or a recommendation about what consultation actually means? Yeah, I think what well, I, I think we've put that back in 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 Barry's plate again to, to sort of apply his mind to that in terms of how we could produce a bit more of a I don't know a framework in terms of how consultations happen and that they happen prior to the event. Yes, yes, we have we have such a framework both in, uh, but what we will do is make sure that it's it's more simply expressed and it applies to uh, community consultation as well as to planning and so on. So we have um, uh, and it's based on the. Uh, Perfect. I think probably sharing, Arstein approach, I think sharing that with councillors would be would be useful yeah. um, and we can share with this committee as well. OK. Could I have a minute to please chair that I'm not supporting um, the recommendations as they are now? Uh, we will be coming up with some. Uh, some absolutely. Questions. Yep, absolutely. Thank OK, you. that's noted as yes. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for asking us. Um, and um, yeah, being here and, and um, adding flavour to it. <laughs>
Um, on that note, we're going to move on through our agenda. So A5 is now done. Thank you very much then. Bye. Thank you. I shall leave you for the evening. Well, Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you. Uh, so we're moving on to A6. There's my agenda. Right. A6, as we can move the screen up. Right. OK, so we've got Paul and presumably Ellen um, from Grant Thornton. Um, let's I'll hand over to them. Annual audit letter first. Thank you. Um, so uh, thank you. In terms of the annual audit letter, this is uh, this is the easiest one. Every year we're required to issue uh, an annual audit letter which summarizes the work that we've done uh, in totality at a high level uh, for the year that's that's been concluded. So this annual audit letter contains nothing that you haven't already seen before. It is a highly summarized version of the audit findings report that you received in detail at the September audit committee and which um, was then finalized when we issued our opinion a few weeks later. Uh, we share it. We share it with you out as uh, as a as a courtesy, but there are no new messages in there. So I don't propose to then go through the report in any significant detail uh, unless members like to, on the basis that there's there's everything in there you've already seen uh, relating to to last year's audit. But happy to pause and take any questions if there are any on this before moving on to this year's reports. Great, thank you, Paul. Any questions on this from members? Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, is this is this annual audit letter? Is this is this a public document? It is. Yes. It is because I just wondered. I know it's very difficult to summarise, and we've seen a more detailed report. But there are things in here about sort of you know concerns about sufficient audit evidence and financial forecasts and significant challenge in obtaining documents and explanations from the pro council's property valuation specialists. And I just wondered if there was any merit in in, in expanding just on those because it just to me left left questions if this is a public report, although we have seen a more extensive report ourselves. Uh, do you mean expanding on those now, you mean? Now or even in the report, if it's going to be public. Sure. So so in terms of the report, it's um, it, it's I, th I mean, I th yeah, I, th I mean, in, t in terms of the expanding on it in the report there's I, I guess it, it would be a case really if you felt there was anything misleading in there the um what we've tried to do is summarize at the highest level without necessarily going into that level of detail otherwise um the 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 i suppose the purpose of the summary be, becomes a little lost the audit findings report though by virtue of being on your 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 website at the september meeting is also so that the, the further detail relating to that is in the audit findings report and because because you have the, your audit Trans and transparency committee is available to the public uh that report from the september meeting is also available so anybody um who, who wishes to do so can find that greater detail in that report um and it it may be that on the website you may want to direct people to that okay. uh, uh on the part where this report will end up rather than uh, updating this report to say the same as what's in the, already in the other report that's already on your website okay uh, that's clear thank you very much thank you um if i may just a point from me um sure. uh thank you for your thanks to our officers um for the hard work they put in this over um, during the during lockdown or close down or whatever you, what you call it something else. <laughs> um, uh, but thanks for that, and, and obviously thank you to you and your team um, for the work that you've done on this. It must have been no easy task to do this uh, and to complete it. Um, what eleven days in advance of the deadline? Um, so thanks for that. Um, thank you. No, thank you. Question from me in terms of what do you think the sort of you know in, in the corporate world it was always a good idea to sort of send your uh, make sure your finance staff had two weeks holiday every year um, because things tend to pop up when that happens. Um, it's quite difficult um, during COVID because everybody is really sort of working from home constantly. And I assume not taking much holiday. I'm not sure. 
Um, but is that a sort of risk that you you is in the top of your mind? The the, the risk that uh, I suppose uh, you mean the risk of burnout essentially on on the basis that um... well burnout and and actually there's no sort of break in in staff uh, finance staff or um, officers in their role because they're at home and and in front of their computers all the time mm. rather than going off on a two week holiday to Greece when yeah. things come to light. My point. Yes. No. I, I think I think that is um, a, a live risk which applies uh, to all bodies. To be honest, uh, and 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 Kensington's not it not um, not immune from that. I think um, the uh, and as I know personally, it, it is far harder to switch off and have a break when you're you you are essentially having a holiday locked down in your own workplace. <laughs> and yes. uh, I think it, it does require a, a, a concerted effort to make sure that happens both on the part of the individual and I think encouragement from the organization as well so um, I, I agree with you I think that risk is, is an even greater risk at the moment than, than it's ever been for those reasons um, uh, and not just not just here but I, th but I think in, in general and I would reiterate the importance of, of doing so that um, if, 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 if officers of the council haven't felt able to, to have that break I would encourage that is is reinforced and reiterated by, by senior management. And um, similarly, uh, I, I think it's it's uh, members mentioning it here equally does no harm as well. OK, thank you. Um, and then a quick question on the fees, sort of page 18 and page 23. Yeah. Just remind me of the process of you filling in the blanks on the fees. Uh, it, uh, on the annual audit letter. Yeah. So the, so the fees reported at the end of, uh, so on page 18 of the annual audit letter, those are the fees we reported for the 2019-20 audit. What they also include is uh, an uplift which has um, been discussed and it's in, in the process of discussing with PSAA okay. relating to the additional costs of the uh, essentially auditing uh, remotely. Um, so those, those are the fees which are then subject to PSAA determination. Right. Uh, which we're well, in the process of working through those now. Thank you very much. Um, so, Chairman, can I? Yeah, I'm good. No, 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 I'm going on to questions. Who's who's speaking? It's Andrew Ling. I, I didn't... Andrew, there you are. Yeah, I've seen your hand. Yep. Andrew, yeah, yeah. And I can see you. I I discovered I could turn my camera on oh. in incoming pictures, so I now can see you all. <laughs> anyway, uh, Paul, um, I, I'm looking at uh, back on A5. And at the bottom of the first page of Barry's note, he's discussing the um, uh, Kroll report with you. You've responded to Barry. They have indicated they would want more time to consider the value for money aspects of the matters referred to in the Kroll report. Um, would I have expected to see anything about Kroll in your annual audit letter? So not not in the annual audit letter, because although the report is only coming to you now, um, because this is the way the committee timings have worked out, this is based on the work that was actually concluded back in, uh, well, in October and reported to you in its near completion state in September. So at that date, the Kroll report wasn't wasn't out. The uh, it would it we will be taking Kroll into account in terms of the 2020-21 work, which covers uh, essentially the 1st of April 2020 up to the date of reporting later in this year. Um, to to have gone back and um, added this to the annual audit letter. Okay, I understand the timing process. I probably I can't get to my real point is, are we? Is there an expectation there could be some quite significant issues that come out of you looking at the coral report, given that you didn't give a assurance that that there weren't any issues that concerned you. You reserved your position. I, I'm 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 trying trying to ask, well, I am asking, are we going to get some material issues coming in the following year? So what? Um, and uh, does that make us reflect on, I know you said about the timing, et cetera, sure. but it might look a bit awkward right. for you and for us. Uh, so I think it depends on what you call a, 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 I guess, a material or significant issue. My my sense of the crawl report, and and I don't want to prejudge what we do do this year because it's um, it's not only that in terms of us looking at the crawl report in itself in more detail, but also then factoring that into the wider work we do. 
in terms of our value for money work and and the the general themes that we'll be looking at for our value for money work are set out in the audit plan which which i'll, I'll cover shortly um are there any significant findings i think um how best to phrase this at the moment and without fettering obviously my discretion as we go as, 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 as we sort of uh, correlate and 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 cross cross refer to, to wider work that we do during the over the next six months to come at the moment i'm not anticipating any significantly huge findings um beyond what is in the call report or which would have such a, a a major impact on the work that we're doing that it blows everything else out of the water um i say that with with as i say some caution because i don't want to prejudge what what, what we are we end up doing but my reading of the quarrel report is that um whilst there are and, and uh, i'm trying to avoid the phrase lessons to be learned <laughs> um whilst there are whilst they are clearly in there and and it, and it does feature feature um the, the the response i gave um when, when invited by the chair during that discussion which is that it's uh, we will take it into account as part of the wider process arrangements uh, journey that the council is on um there was nothing that i've seen so far that would suggest that that journey is utterly failing um and so in, in in that respect i wouldn't be anticipating um major findings of, of surprise in that sense that will derail the, the the nature of our reporting on the grenfell process to date uh, in the previous value for money reports or indeed as summarized in the annual audit letter i'm not sure if i've answered your question well no, no, no. one more time at it are there any word way, words that you put in your value for money report um with the knowledge of what you're seeing in the crawl report you might find difficult to defend and you might want to re reconsider are, are there any in, well, in, as you presented it the, the, it's a fairly bland point on cu culture at the end of the report oh i see what you mean uh, and i just wonder if you, you might what is this yes you might want to just reconsider the the, the wording no you can't rewrite the past but i think it would just be unfortunate if sure i think so very, in terms, um, sorry muted, well, muted calm terms where i suspect there is not as much calmness about this the a5 report absolutely um, um as we might all wish no absolutely and, and i take that point and 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 also and i think referencing the point you made in uh, during the, the a5 discussion in terms of um uh the ex potential external audit role and I, and i think if i if i sort of i suppose set out where we are in terms of our thinking and context behind what yeah. we've reported so far in terms of grenfell we are we are mindful of the fact first of all that our predecessor auditors haven't finalized their conclusion and whilst we are seeking to share with you more than uh, i think our predecessors did in terms of the narrative particularly in in the in the, the audit findings report which is so, so the annual audit letter is a very as you say uh, relatively bland highly summarized element there is more detail in in our um uh, uh, audit findings report from from the september committee which has a does have more in it than than the annual, annual audit letter report we are nonetheless even in the more detailed report seeking to share more detail of our thinking but without prejudging what the predecessor auditors are going to ultimately say when they do eventually get around to finalising their own work, going all the way back to 1617. We're also very mindful that, that this is an extremely emotional and hot topic, understandably so. Um, and as auditors, we, de we need to be and we need to be seen to be completely and utterly apolitical. And, we, and so we are being very careful not to appear that we're coming down on one side or the other in terms of views of Grenfell and views of everything that's happened since 2016, whilst at the same time not not uh, not falling short of, of sharing what we would otherwise normally share in a less emotional uh, and less political issue that had arisen at any particular council. So the what we are sharing is I was making it as fact based and as evidence based as possible without tipping over into uh, appearing to be uh, an advocate for one or, or another view beyond the evidence that's presented um, and I think that's the right thing to do because we what we need to avoid as auditors is is appearing to have become part of the political process so what we would want to present to you as an audit and transparency committee and indeed uh, I think as, 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 as the chair is, is uh, the, the chair's chairing of this clearly shows this isn't in itself in, in itself this is an apolitical committee um, and uh, 
um, we we are the the harsh wording I think from us would wouldn't be it would be where we where we felt that our review of documents our discussion with with senior management at the council if that was suggesting to us that the issues weren't being taken seriously if what was being said in public didn't match the the intentions uh, and and what we're seeing in terms of intentions behind the scenes we would be reporting that in quite in fairly strong terms but what we need to avoid and, and we've been we're trying to be careful to avoid is using strong terms just to reflect the emotion of the issue rather than using strong terms where actually we see the shortfalls bearing in mind that um i think our view genuinely is that i mean this this we haven't detected within the council notwithstanding the previous uh, shortfalls errors and, and things that went wrong none of my discussions and none of my team's discussions have detected any air within the council that there isn't a willingness to learn, that there isn't a genuine commitment to, to cultural change we haven't detected anything that, that undermines that that commitment internally if we had we'd be reporting that and that would be in fairly strong terms um but but as it as it is and uh, i think without prejudging our pre predecessor um auditors conclusions that would be our reason for the uh the um nature of the way that we're choosing to report okay well thank you for that clarification we'll leave it there um just next question Cosette, you had your hand up but i see it's gone down is that intentional she's gone for she's gone for supper um okay well emma uh denko you're up um thank you chair um I, yeah i am I'm not sure which bit of A6 it was in because I ran out of ink and I just made notes as I was reading through. Um, but there are a few points that I made. Um, one of them was this issue about, um, yeah, and well, particularly on property and um, generally on money making aspects, which, which is an outcomes based approach. I don't know what that means. It just means we're going to make more money um, and, and pretend that that's going to going to the community um then i need to know actually what that means because um actually you know we're not we're not actually tackling with the real issues as i see them um so what 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 kind of outcomes are we looking for um and then again you were talking about the cultural change and i don't know what that means either um um and um you know they do have to be articulation measurable i just actually want to see what we mean by that because you know there's a lot of um, soft words and um I shouldn't say platitudes, but I do feel like platitudes. Uh, and, and we're not focused. Um, we don't really know what what they mean. And there's a lot of lovely, lovely soft words and kind words. And um, um, but I don't, I don't really see what we're aiming for. And if in a in a council like you know Kensington and Chelsea, if we're not actually dealing with um, you know with this lovely new uh, cultural change, we're not dealing with with our poorest communities. We're not, um, or talking to them properly that they add colour when we speak to them, which I know was a slip of the tongue, but, um, you know, I felt that was quite significant. Um, then uh, then we're failing. And um, and just to say in the, um, while we kept percolating about this, the first um, Kroll report um, revealed, which was just on the um, the transactions around the Wanton College, um, the, the legal advice, the legal advice for that so that they weren't going to reveal um, this, um, they weren't going to publicise what the council was doing. It certainly didn't to, to local councillors and didn't to the public and didn't to anybody. They were trying to keep it quiet because they didn't want to face judicial review. And they actually said, uh, we'll keep it quiet in case a few rogue councillors wanted to challenge us. So we in Gohorn were called rogue councillors. And if there isn't a clearer example of what some, you know, hopefully not any more, but certainly in the history, and I think it's in the ether, that the legal advice, in the legal advice, we were called rogue councillors, and that is really offensive. Um, obviously, this whole thing, it was so toxic, so awful, it has been reversed. Uh, the council has lost 18 million, actually. The asking price was 28, um, not 25. But um, yeah, I just think, um, you know, we have to be just a bit clear about what we're aiming for, because I don't see that's what Councillor Blakeman was saying earlier. I don't really know what cultural change means. Mm -hmm. I don't okay. think it's change. I honestly thank, don't. I genuinely thank you, Emma. You, you're in danger of going rogue right now. Uh, is there a question in there for Paul? Um, yeah, can, 
what yes well what what do we mean um what is an outcome based approach and what is cultural change i don't know i don't know what we're looking for okay. uh, outcome based approach i think is the sort of key yeah we're we'll, 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 we just talking about money let's have a you okay. know all over to you Sure. So in terms, uh, and I'm trying to find it specifically where, where in the audit, le the annual audit letter that phrase is, and, and I can see in the cultural change we're talking about, uh, we, we are talking about the, uh, the, the, uh, the outcomes. The outcomes we're referring to and the outcomes that, that we've been discussing has been looking at transformation, looking at, and so, and, and the cultural change with a view that the outcomes based approach is based on outcomes for taxpayers and residents and service users that those are the outcomes that 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 um that, that, that feature in the discussions we have with with senior officers at the council uh, management at the council um and they're the and they're the outcomes that we mean it's not about getting the this i suppose that you know the biggest profit from a transaction um it is about outcomes and, and the best use of um taxpayers money in order to to to, to do so our work looks at the arrangements in place rather than so. So what we don't do is say whether or not value for money has been achieved. And what we also don't do, and, and we need to, we, again, as I say, being very, very careful not to do is prejudge not just our predecessor auditors, but the actual Grenfell inquiry itself in, in, in terms of those findings. We need that, that needs to be do need to be very careful of, of that. The culture change, um, and I agree with you, I, I'm not a big fan of the, of the, of the phrase culture change, um, not least because the minute you tell anybody that you were engaging in culture change, you, 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 it's a self-defeating property because people don't want to feel that their culture is being changed um, when that's being done to them. It, it is a shorthand term, and, and um, but what it essentially means, it 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 it, 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 it sums up really uh, the entire discussion. I think that's happened this evening so far. It is previously uh, the the uh, which the council seems to acknowledge is that its decision making was focused with different outcomes in mind from the ones that it necessarily should have had in mind and the culture change is to move that thinking and to then distill it throughout the organization into the outcomes based thinking that, that should drive decision making now that the council wants to wants to get to. Uh, I do take your point that the wording is um, uh, and I would say de deliberately uh, inoffensive is is, is, is is the word I would, I would say about it and, and that's partly because we're not we're seeking not to uh, as for, well, for reasons I mentioned before what we do say in the wording though we do refer to the fact and in the more detailed report to the fact that it's taking quite some time uh to uh, uh to, to to embark on this and again that's not necessarily a criticism because i think there would be a danger if the council was looking to, to seem to be racing ahead with this it would it would appear relatively insensitive so that so there's um thank you paul there's method in the madness i think <laughs> in in terms of what we what we what we see um but that essentially is what what we mean by culture change and outcomes based Thank you very much. Um, just in terms of moving on, I mean, I know we're, we're sort of blurred the line slightly between your three reports here, uh, not least started by me when I started talking about the fees, which was actually on the audit plan rather than, oh, right. <laughs> rather than on the audit letter. Um, has anyone got any comments on the audit plan? Uh, the only comment I would make is that on page 14, obviously it's, it states specifically um, that the Audit and Transparency Committee members understand the characteristics of the methods and models, et cetera, et cetera, um, yes. which I believe David will cover a little later on in the evening. Yeah. If, um, if I could also pick up on, on your fee, because I, 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 you say a question about how to fill the gaps on this one. Yes. Um, so what, what's happening at them? So, so um, as, as you'll know from previous um, the past couple of years, the fees have been higher than, than set out in the initial scale fee. That's now been recognised by MHCLG, which has committed funding to all councils for the um, for the fees. The funding should pretty much cover the, the level of fees as they were reported in the 1920, uh, the 1920 annual audit letter. Uh, and also take into account some of the uplifts which have to happen this year because the VFM work has, is changing in terms of its scope. Um, so the process from here is we are awaiting the outcome of the MHCLG work and we're waiting uh, understanding of how much uh, various different councils are likely to get and what we will then do is offset that against um, uh, or, or add that in and then reports to you at the final position in terms of uh, the fees once all funding is also known that comes that is now backing those fees as well okay thank you understood sorry for the confusion um anyone else uh, liz has got a question yeah 
Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, just just two, two, two points. First of all, on materiality, that you've increased the percentage to 1.5% from 1.3%. I mean, that's a 13% change. I just wonder what the basis for that was, because that would seem to me to indicate you're planning on less uh, testing. And then um, when we look at override of controls, um, you look essentially at the controls over journal entries. And I just wondered about what about the wider controls and to what extent do you do compliance testing? Because in an organisation such as this, it's very important. There are, you know, internal controls are tested. And I appreciate internal audit do a lot of that, but I also wondered to what extent you, you yourselves look at that. Sure. So in terms of materiality, it's gone up by a million over the over the prior year, um, largely because the forecast expenditure for this year. Uh, I'm, I'm not. A, 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 apologies if I am uh, going. To, I'm about to say something wrong. I wasn't sh sure that we had um, increased the percentage. I, th I believe it was 1.5 percent last year. It's just that the level of spend in last year was slightly lower than than the forecast spend for this year. 1.3. Oh, could you? Uh, let me it's just. Yeah. I concur. It does say 1.3 last it year. It might be a typo, Paul. It might be a typo. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah, so, so my understanding is the percentage hasn't changed. I, I will double check, but my understanding is the percentage hasn't changed. If it does say 1.3, as uh, my colleague says, it may be a typo. So ap apologies for that. But our, our overall assessment of, I mean, materiality is driven by our, our assessment of risk. And in this 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 case, our, our, our assessment of the, the risk of material misstatement in your financial statements. The financial, uh, the finance team and the and the rate the processes and arrangements in place to produce the financial statements are are pretty good and so so 1.5 percent is at the higher end of our materiality levels um and and it's there because the overall the the likelihood of material misstatement in your accounts is lower uh, than than other organizations yeah, of a similar that. size yeah. um in terms of the controls point uh, I, I agree. So, so in terms of journals, they are part of our, uh, what we call this, this, the significant risks facing the council. We we walk through your journal transactions. Um, we do do significant substantive testing. We don't do a controls based approach for journals. Um, the main reason for that being it is actually more efficient and effective for us to gain our uh, to gain our assurance through the substantive um, approach. Okay. The, what we're looking for in terms of your journals essentially is to test whether fraud has arisen. So we do a lot of analysis uh, of journal patterns, journal profile, the posting. We look for, th for things which are overt in terms of, so for example, the largest journals. We look in, you know, things that haven't been approved in the way that it should be. But we also look for things that are part of trends. We look at some of your lower value journals as, as a trend. We see whether those volumes are increasing or whether they're decreasing. We see what we look to see whether the number of journals per, per finance officer has increased or decreased compared to what we used to, or whether the number of journals in particular cost centres have increased or decreased. Um, and if so, we follow those up. So it, we're looking for patterns as well as um, uh, as well as actual journals to understand how risky it is that fraud has entered your system and journals are being processed in a way that they that they shouldn't be. Um, the controls testing would give us a, a small amount of uh, sure, additional assurance beyond that. But actually, in terms of we, if we did controls testing, it would cost you more, more, but wouldn't necessarily give you that much more assurance over the way that we currently do it. So we've adopted the approach we've taken, because having walked through your processes and analysed and data analysed all of the journals that you have, um, it, it's the most cost effective way of getting the assurance that we need for your opinion. Plus the fact we know that internal audit does indeed do controls testing itself in that area. Okay, thank you. For that. I just just want once, once sorry, just. And also the, the risks of significant value for money weaknesses. Yeah. Um, I see that you have service transformation and cultural change, but I just wondered if there was anything there for Grenfell, Grenfell recovery. Uh, yes. Yes. Um, what what we've so it, it is uh, it's 20. Yeah. Yes, the second bullet point in terms of um, continued uh, le re recovery, recovery process. Although we haven't said Grenfell by name, that's what we mean. OK, OK, fine. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Liz. Cosette? Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I had two very similar questions, but not quite the same. Um, just returning to the uh, materiality on page 18, 
I wanted to ask, and I think this goes directly to the percentage point as well, why there was an increase in materiality from 10 to 11 million. By my reckoning, the reason why the percentage went up is because the materiality level went up. And there was also a, 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 an increase on the council misstatements comparatively. Is there a reason why that decision was made? And then I also had a second question, but I'll pause there. Okay, so in terms of the materiality in and of itself, it, it is based by and large on um, two aspects. One is uh, what level of error in the financial statements would cause a reader of the accounts to be misled over the financial position of the council um, by virtue of, of the size of that error. Uh, and given given the scale uh, and, and sort of almost three quarters of a billion pound of spend, which, which goes through the council's accounts, 1.5% uh, is, is at the higher end, um, and so the difference between 10 and 11 million, it's, no, it's not saying that, that the council now has leeway to make 11 million pounds worth of errors and will do nothing about it. Um, what it's saying is that even if there were an error of 11 million, um, and whether that's 11 million or 10 million to, to an extent, it wouldn't necessarily uh, mislead a reader of the accounts as to the financial position of the council. I, I appreciate that. My question is why the change? Because as you say, 1.5% is on the higher end. So what was the motive behind changing it from 10 to 11 million? Sure. So the other, so that I said there were two parts. And the second part I was about to come on to is uh, the, that we also take into account is the quality of the finance team pulling the accounts together and the quality of the accounts overall. We'd never expect there to be zero, zero um, errors. Um, but by and large, the quality of the finance team and the quality of the accounts, the quality of the working papers and the, the, the quality of the understanding of those finance, of, of, the, of the accounts that we see demonstrated to us is good. So we think the risk is lower of there being a material misstatement. And that is why we, I was comfortable moving from 10 million to 11 million, because the, uh, the risk of error is lower. Uh, and on that basis, if there's a lower risk of error, um, then, then it supports a, a million pound jump in terms of the level of materiality we're operating at. OK, thank you. My next question also has to do with Grenfell, but this goes sure. also back to the letter as well. Um, whilst I appreciate that it is important to keep track of expenditures on all matters, including that recovery process, I do find it, um, given that you said this was a public document, to see Grenfell Fire Recovery mentioned in a section that says value for money conclusion seems a bit, well, it could be misinterpreted to the lay person's eyes. Is there a particular reason why we feel compelled to talk about value for money with regard to Grenfell Fire Recovery activities specifically? And is there no other way that we can convey the sentiments that need to be conveyed in that regard differently? I think I, I completely take that point. It, the, we are constrained to an extent. Um, so so there's, there's two parts to the audit. Under statute, there's two things that, that overall that I need to do. One is to issue an opinion on your financial statements, and the other is to issue an opinion or a conclusion on the arrangements you have in place to secure value for money. Um, I completely take your point that having the two together in that summarized form um yeah that I, I well i completely i completely take that point what we can do i think is look at how we um as, as well as in terms of the 2021 plan we haven't used the word grenfell although we will be covering we following up in terms of that particular area um in, in terms of our value for money work and i and i think we we would still seek to not do that uh, we, you know, we we will in, when we come to report against it, we will use the exact wording we've got in the plan, where we talk about the leadership of the recovery process rather than Grenfell as as a, as, as a name. However, that I think your point would still stand. To be honest, that we we have a value for money section which is linked with Grenfell. I, um, I think I think you know it's it's understandable that you would look at value for money for Grenfell um, just along with any other expenditure because you must. Yeah. As you said, it's it's required, it's not optional. I'm just saying that presentationally, there may be other ways to achieve the goal of sharing information about that, that's all. The way it's set out in the letter, it just optically could create the wrong impression. 
Yeah, I, I can. Yeah, no, I, I, I get. I understand that. Uh, we, we, we will have a think about it. I think the what we can't do is change the name of that part. There's only of that. It's a statutory requirement that we report on your arrangements to secure value for money, and we can't change that because we, we're bound by. I, your understand, I understand you can't change the value for money, but you cannot. You can presentationally make your points in a different way. That's all I'm saying. Well, we're making them under the value for money aspect. It's not about what you spent. It's about the arrangements you have in place. Um, but we'll we'll take that on board and 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 uh, see what we can do in terms of the optics of that. Thank you. Paul, could, could you not just have another paragraph? Could we what? Sorry. Could you not just have a separate paragraph for that to make sure it's, that they are separate issues? That's a suggestion for you. Sure, there, there there may be ways that we can we can report this. I mean, ultimately, it's um, th there's no getting away from the fact that we are we will be following up in terms of the arrangements on this area under what is called the value for money conclusion, and there's no getting away from that. But we can look at how we present it so that it's um, it's not so clear. We we don't have value for money with the next word being Grenfell. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Paul, we'd appreciate if you had a had a yeah. Thought. Um. Moving on to the progress report, um, has anyone got any questions on this? Seems pretty yeah. straightforward. It's pretty straightforward. The only thing I just want a bit of clarity on is um, your point on page four on other areas, just in terms of the teachers' pensions. Yeah. Um, yes. Understanding that that is the pension administrators, which is Surrey, who, who we are looking to move away from. Is that correct? Uh, it's Hampshire. It's, it's it's the teachers' pension scheme, not your local government pension scheme. So right. it's the Sorry. it's the um, Hampshire. Hampshire administrate that for you. Yeah. Okay. Um, I I I think the answer, Ian, is that the um, teachers are in an unfunded government scheme. Um, not the LGPS, right. and yeah. uh, the government wants this assurance so that they, they know that accurate information and contributions are being sent by local authorities. I see. Mm -hmm. Got it. I trust they ask for the same from academies. Perfect. Thank you. Um, any further questions on that? No. Right, then it's it's good night, Paul. Thank you very much. Thanks. Your Thank you. Help. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are now moving on, unless I've missed something, we're now moving on to A7. Is that correct? Yes, right, IBC update. Um, Hi. This. Hi, good evening. Uh, for those committee members I haven't met, I'm Debbie Morris, Director of HR, and I'm going to jointly present this report this evening with my colleague, Terry Neves. Um, so this report provides the committee with an update on the IBC partnership. So since December 18, we've been in partnership with Hampshire, who provide our transactional HR, payroll and financial services. Um, with re I'm going to cover the HR matters. So um, the processes are quite well embedded now, uh, two years on, and things are generally working well. We have a couple of challenges still at the moment with the IBC. Uh, one is recruitment and one is our learning management system. So with regards to the recruitment system, um, we haven't managed to work with Hampshire to get the success factor system working as we would like it to, which has meant that a lot of time was being spent by managers um, trying to process their recruitment activity. As a consequence, we've got a small in-house team who's now assisting with that process, and that has resulted in matters um, being speeded up with um, conditional offers of employment and all of the clearances being obtained quicker. With regards to the learning management system, again, that's um, a bit of software called Success Factors, and we are incurring some difficulties in staff completing um, their training records and getting some connection problems. This matter is still being investigated at the moment and we hope to have a resolution soon. 
we also have some future developments in the pipeline which are outlined in in section 7.4 of the report and they will also assist the process one key activity is at the moment staff enter their own sickness absence onto the system and um, within a month or so managers will also be able to end sickness absence for their staff so in um, just generally covering the communication side, um, over the past year, both Taryn and I have worked um, with our teams to ensure that all of the information that's required for staff and managers is in one hub. Um, and those hubs are posted on the council's intranet site and contain all the policies and procedures and updates that are needed. So that's all I wanted to cover on the HR and payroll side. I'll hand over to Tarim for finance. And happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Debbie. And evening, everybody. So uh, Debbie's covered a lot. And I was just going to say a couple of things around progress with the finance side of the system. So I think we've highlighted in the report that fairly good progress has been made in, in all areas. I think just a couple of areas that I wanted to flag tonight to you was firstly around budgeting and forecasting. Um, so I think when we came to talk to you uh, this time last year, we obviously said that that was a part of the system that we hadn't necessarily used its uh, full functionality at the time. There's been some really good progress in this area, um, and particularly for me, uh, budgeting and forecasting, and it picks up on something that Barry mentioned earlier, it's less so about the system. There's something for me much more fundamental around kind of budget management budget manager ownership and accountability and certainly a lot of the work that we've been doing over the last year is about some of those roles and responsibilities so there's some really good progress and I think some of what kind of Barry touched on was some of the reporting so very much you know for that budget manager it's not just about the finance information it's about the performance you know and a whole range of other data that goes with it so the system for me is important I know that's what this update is about today However, for me, I think it's much wider, much wider than that. Um, the second area that I wanted to flag, and it was also an area that we talked about this time last year, is around essentially the procurement and purchasing side of the system. Again, I've included some stats in the paper, and you can see that we've definitely come a long way in the last 12 months. We always knew this would probably be the hardest one uh, to adopt. It's based on very much a self-serve model. Um, that's the operating model with the IBC and it's absolutely the right model. It just wasn't something that we had in place before. So done lots and lots of work with services and you can see that it's going in the right direction, but we haven't quite yet here hit where we want to be on kind of uh, partnership targets. Um, some of the things that we've got in place for that is we've got a dedicated task and finish group that is really working very targeted with individual services and individuals that are struggling with adopting the new model. And this has very much been um, supported by real detailed data that the IBC can provide us to support us with that. So performance in most areas is really well and it's just a couple of individual service areas where for lots of reasons and lots of barriers um, just is taking us longer to, to adopt that. But I think really good progress and I feel fairly confident that hopefully, she says, this time next year when I come and talk to you that we are well within those uh, partnership targets. Debbie's touched on developments. I think it's a great opportunity. I think this time last year, we'd only just come out of stabilisation really uh, getting engaged in some of those uh, development discussions. So I think for me, there are always improvements to a system. Um, just it can be the best system in the world, but you always want to make sure it's very much uh, fit for purpose. So the development discussions that we're having are, are really quite critical now. And that's it for me. Happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you, Taryn. Um, any questions from the committee members? Uh, Emma? Thank you, Chair. Um, just two uh, quick ones, really. And I'm sorry, I couldn't review this because I said I run out of ink and I'm much better on paper than um, to, uh, for this kind of level of um, um, detail. But I think it's somewhere in the report, it's uh, page four, it talks about rejected invoices, which is people not getting their paperwork right, and late payments and late, you know, late payment. I don't know what that means. Tell me, tell me, please tell me late payments aren't super late. Um, 18%, that's that's high. And rejected invoices, 15%. Obviously, bureaucracies, are, you know, 
uh, problem. But it, um, please explain what a late payment is. So if uh, so, late payment and also kind of uh, rejected invoices, the two are interlinked. Um, so the IBC operates on the model of no no PO, no pay. So essentially that is absolutely the right practice to have. So purchase orders are raised before invoices are paid. Now that is a real shift. And I think I, I talked about this last year as well. That's a real shift in Kensington. We didn't, we had the policy, but it wasn't necessarily embedded. So any invoice that doesn't have a PO um, when it comes through will be classed as a rejected invoice. And, and that's certainly the area that we're really, really focusing on um, that we absolutely must address. And that's about embedding the no PO, uh, no pay. And I think we're making some good progress, but you can see from the performance information, you know, we were at 45%, I think in December 2019, but there is still a long way to go. And some of those are, um, uh, as we moved over systems, there's quite a few of historic invoices um, that obviously wouldn't have had the PO raised that are obviously um, um, now being processed through the system. So it's not a great not a great position to be in, and I can't stand here and say that you know we fully adopted that policy, but we are moving in the right direction. Okay, is that connected with the late payments then? Uh, some of, some of it is. Um, so I think. Uh, a couple of times it worries me when when businesses aren't, aren't being paid, obviously. Yeah, so perhaps I, I mean, I, I haven't, I should have the data at hand, really. I think the question you're really asking is about um, invoices paid after 30 days. And we do have those stats, so I can share those with you. Um, I think this is much more, it's, unfortunately, it's, it's my fault, it's grouped as one category. But I think that particular uh, performance stat is much more about the, what we call retro POs, where the PO didn't exist before the invoice uh, was but let me get the data for you on late invoices and we can circulate that after the meeting. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. I think that's it for questions. Thank you very much, Taryn. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks all. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and for anyway, um, just a note here for old timers such as myself and Councillor Dent Code. We, we we really need these printed um, copies uh, posted out to us for these for these meetings. It's it's a lot easier to be able to go through them. No, uh, noted. Thank you. Um, regardless of whether we ask them or not, I think really if you if you say you don't want it, you're happy to do it online. Then then don't send them. But everyone else should really get them. Um, moving on to A eight. Um, who is on this? Um, Chair, I'll, yeah, happy to pick yeah. it up. So, um, so for the committee's approval, we've we've uh, reviewed two of our counter fraud policies. That's the whistleblowing policy, which was due for annual review, and the anti money anti money laundering policy, which we've also reviewed. Um, so, what we're doing is bringing all these policies into a line now, into alignment now, so that they'll be reviewed annually in November and brought to you, to you together as one suite. Uh, I believe that uh, Esme will have sent out to you pre, um, before the meeting um, marked up copies of the policies to show where the changes are. But I'll just pick up on the, the key elements in both documents very briefly. So on the whistleblowing policy, the main change relates to our new independent whistleblowing uh, hotline provider. So that's uh, Protect, Speak Up, Stop Harm. So it's a charity that's helping us to both um, take and root uh, concerns raised by employees independently in a way they could they have confidence that their anonymity will prote be protected where they, they require that. And they also offer advice as well to, to people who want to raise concerns. Uh, we, we've also got a suite of online training that covers both whistleblowing and anti-money laundering, which Andy will be sending out to members of the committee after the meeting. So you can see what uh, what training is available to, to our officers across the, the organisation as well. And the second policy we, which we've updated relates to anti-money laundering. And we discussed this at the previous meeting. So thank, thanks to the the, to the, um, the, the suggestions that were made then. We've included uh, an emphasis on uh, tipping off being an offence within the policy. Uh, and that will also be referred to explicitly in the staff training. In terms of the threshold for uh, significant uh, sums, We've reviewed that in line with what we were asked to do last time. We're going to maintain that at £10,000 currently because that's in line with HMRC guidance on what represents a significant amount. But we're going to keep this under review and do some benchmarking uh, in, in, in time for the, the, the next review of the policy in November with other councils to see whether we need to or, or, or there's scope for reducing that down. 
So I just reiterate that, uh, that there is e-learning available for staff, which we'll be promoting, and we'll make sure we send out the links to members of the committee uh, after the meeting uh, today. Thank you, David. Uh, we've got a question from Councillor Lindsay. Um, I have two, they're slightly different. Uh, 1.1, um, at the end of the policy statement, the expectation is that employees will want to raise to raise concerns they have about the way services are being provided or about possible fraud, theft or corruption services. Great, the expectation may be that. If you look at how whistleblowers traditionally have been treated over the last, I don't know how many decades, across industry, that is a very, very high expectation for us to have in this document compared with how they've been treated. It may be that the hope is that they will uh, raise their concerns, but I think to say it's an expectation, even if we actually hope it is, 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 is putting a pretty high um, bar to the uh, document. Hmm. No, that's a, that's a helpful point, Councillor Lindsay. I think, from my point of view, we, we, we'd expect that they would want to rather than expect that they would they must. So I think there, there, there is a point of emphasis there, but I do take your point, which I'm happy to take away and consider and review that. I think what, what we've done by having a sort of independent hotline in place as well is, is to give that confidence and reassurance to uh, in members of staff who want to raise concerns, they can do so confidentially without doing so within the organisation. Which does, you know, it does help in some instances to provide that reassurance. But I do take your point. And a second point, uh, policy statement on, on paragraph one point two. This policy applies to all employees and officers of the council. Where do councillors fit in? Because we are not technically employees. You raised the question I was going to raise too. I had the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we are That's employees. A... <laughs> we get paid through. Um, and and through a, on a schedule e basis mostly i think but that yes. does not mean to say that we are technically employees so yes Thank no I, I appreciate that so perhaps we, again we can look to expand that uh, if the committee wishes to do so because in the second sentence we talk about others who aren't directly employed by the council but operate and perform functions um relating to the council's activity so again if, if the committee is it would like us to do that we can amend that to include councillors as well but you see, I wouldn't have to perform a function in relation to the council work. I mean, it, it's different. Clearly, we are involved, and our involvement is primarily in relation to um, decision making and governance. Mm. But I wouldn't say that it is um, directly council work in the sense of uh, the no. provision of services. I appreciate it. I'll, I'm happy to take that away, Councillor Lindsay, and come back um, with a response on that. I think what we would do is encourage any council that has the concerns to, to approach us directly anyway, whether that's through whistleblowing or just to raise concerns they have about particular issues, which we can we can review and investigate. But I'm happy to take that away and, and look at whether we want to, to or need to, to amend that that in, in, a, in a particular way. D David, what happens in other councils? Is there a best practice on this? Uh, that's something I'll look into, Chair. So it's something again. Typically, you would you would whistleblowing would come from from employees, from staff, um, yeah. and from from contractors. But something I'm happy to go away and do some some further work on. We'll come back to you. Okay, um, Cosette, are you, is your hand still up? Or are you? Yes, it is. Thank you. Um, I did have one other point to make, which it would be very helpful if, when these are presented to the committee for consideration that track changes be used so that we can see precisely where the changes and updates have been made. It's one thing to mention something on a cover note, but there's nothing quite like doing track changes on a document. So my, my apologies, I thought I understood that um, separately that copies had been sent out showing track changes, but if that's not the case, I do apologize and I can make sure that happens going forward. So we wanted to make sure you'd had both the, the, sort of the published version, as it were here, plus the, the one that had the track changes on as well. But sure, perhaps that perhaps didn't happen. just my technology not working accordingly. No, <laughs> apologies if that didn't happen. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure we fix that going forward. Sorry. Yes, yeah, you, I appreciate you raised that previously as well. So we, we'd yes. sought to do the right thing by making sure we circulated the, the, the other copies as well. But I'll, I'll double check on that. Thank you. Sorry about the trouble. No, no problem. No problem. Thank you, all. Chair. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions,
then we can move on. I've got my hand up. Oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, no, it's just quick. Uh, I was, I was going to raise. Sorry. The, yeah. But it's okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, it was, it was just that um, you've answered the point on the ten thousand. That's going to be reviewed because that was, that was in the minutes and was outstanding. Yes. Um, I noted in the anti, and I know you're going to send these out in an email, but I noted in the anti money laundering procedures that there's an express um, obligation to make uh, staff aware of the requirements and the duties. But I just, but there's nothing in the whistleblowing policy to do that. And I wondered if something should be introduced there to do that. So I, I, we, we do do that. So I'm happy to include that in the policy as well, just to make it absolutely clear that we do. Yeah, that's, okay. that's not a problem. Yeah, indeed. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. That's really helpful. Thank you. I'm sorry, Chair. I actually no, had another question. May I please yes, ask it? Of course. Um, thank you very much. Um, I did have another question. Um, whistleblowing tends to have two vectors of consideration. One of them is the one that's specifically mentioned here about the way services are being provided or about possible fraud, theft, or corruption. What about um, how how does this relate to safeguarding and and concerns about the vulnerable and how those might get flagged up indeed so there there are separate um, policies that the council has regarding safeguarding but again i'm happy that as as we have done elsewhere previously where we would make reference to those arrangements within the whistleblowing policy here so there are arrangements to report both internally safeguarding issues and to the likes of cqc and other agencies on on safeguarding concerns regarding children and adults it might be worth including yeah. that reference. Absolutely. Yeah, happy to do that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, well, thank you, David. That's all on A8. And then you're up again for A9 with Karen, I think. Indeed, Chair. Um, so does everyone have a copy of this? So this was sent round by Esme yeah. on Friday. To, yeah. to all members of the committee. Yeah, shall I just say, shall I happy if I just say a few words, David? So yeah, we've, so okay, Chair, yeah. So uh, we put we put forward just, uh, this is following up on an action from a, a previous meeting where a detailed note was asked for um, in terms of Grenfell expenditure, essentially from uh, June 2017, not just up, up to date, but also forward looking for the remainder of the Grenfell recovery strategy. So what we're setting out today, there's an extraordinary meeting that's been arranged for the 11th of May, um, which hopefully all committee members have now got in their diary, um, where we will be bringing uh, to you the full report, um, setting our um, spend to date. What we wanted to do today was give you an outline of the scope of the report, and in particular, how we were going to structure it, so that you've got an opportunity just to feed into that, provide us any feedback. Is there anything specifically that you want included in that report so that it would be a joint report from David and myself, um, uh, just so we can make sure that we pick that up as part of the final report. So we weren't necessarily going to speak about any of the detailed numbers today. It was much more about the expectation of what you would want to see in that report. We think, we, we think we've captured it, but just an opportunity for the committee to add anything specific, just so that we make sure that you've got that full rounded report when you, when you see it in May. Thank you. Um, question from Liz. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank you very much. And um, thank you for your paper. I suppose this is very much focused on financial. Your, your report's focused very much on the financial aspects. But I note that the Audit and Transparency Committee is, in accordance with point two, is independent scrutiny of the financial and non-financial performance. And I just question, are we fulfilling our responsibilities completely if we're just focused on the financial aspects of Grenfell? But it may be other people have, have views on that as well. So may, may I ask David Lindsay, do, do you want to sort of step in here with your dual role? Um, <laughs> you can say I, I, no. I, this. I think, I th oh, sorry, sorry, Councillor Lindsay, sorry. If you want to say anything, David Hughes, you may. I was just going to say, I, I would take the sentence as a whole, Councillor Lindsay, in terms of to the extent it affects the authority's exposure to risk and weaknesses weaknesses in the control mm -hmm. environment. So it's, this committee is very much focused on 
the financial statements of the authority, which is absolutely right, and on the, the, the risk and control arrangements that the, the authority has, rather than necessarily on, on what the money has been spent uh, or on who it has been spent on. So I think that's the, the sort of clarification I'd like to give there. Um, Liz, what I was going to say is that there are a number of other committees, particularly the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, of which I'm a member, has been receiving uh, emails from one particular Grenfell-related uh, survivor, bereaved and survivor group, uh, asking for questions, which I guess has been the driver for the meeting that we've got uh, on the 11th of May. Ian, you can confirm that. What uh, actually, I, I'm just going to jump in there. It's not. Mm. We requested this long before. Okay, fine. Yeah. yeah. But the but the answer, Liz, is that is that a number of different committees, or certainly two different committees there may be others are looking at the different questions that have been asked by this one particular um, Grenfell related um, bereaved and survivor group and I'm sure there are others as well that um, will, will are being and will be looked at and mm -hmm. I'm really only on one scrutiny committee and there are other committees that are also there but more than that I will await any any other questions from you or not as the case may be. So using that, David, uh, David Hughes now. Um, so I think just sort of setting the framework of what we've got, just just yeah. repeat your sort of earlier point of we're there to understand the, the finances and where the money went and the procurement, etc. Yeah, and particularly around the, the the way in which the authorities managed the exposure to risk and any and the controls it had in place to 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 to, to make the expenditure and to, to monitor the expenditure. So yeah. specifically, not to scrutinise. Um, yeah. What's the right word for it? The effect and effect effectiveness mm -hmm. of that expenditure. Yeah, in terms of how it. Yes, in terms of what it what it was spent on, and and questioning whether it should have been spent on other things, which again is yeah. perhaps something more aligned to scrutiny. Yeah. Okay. Is that all right, Liz? What do you What do you think? Uh, I, I don't know. It's difficult because I don't. I'm not quite clear who. I mean, somebody must be scrutinising this somewhere, and you know, there's a whole structure of committees. But I I'm just I am a bit concerned in case something gets missed yes so what, what what we can do chair if it helps is just to set a bit more a bit more background and context to, to what reporting goes has been going on already to different committees um just to signpost that for members of this committee when we bring the report back i think that would be helpful yeah yes definitely helpful to put that in at the beginning at, at what other committees are doing on this and what other committees are looking at indeed yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Chair, Chair, can I just, sorry, yep, just add no, one okay. slide or just, just to, to that question. So I think what will also be helpful in that report is almost we want to avoid it just being a table of numbers. Um, so what we'll also be including um, is, you know, the number of people say supported, not not who they are or whether that was right. But I think it's important to put give it give the numbers some context um, in terms of uh, numbers of people supported or number of, you know, that that particular spend relates to. So I think certainly when we when we included the non financial information, I think that's more, much more what we were yeah. referring to as opposed to the actual performance. It's just that I, I almost find that sometimes tables of finances mean nothing without a little bit of context around, uh, how, you know, what, what it's being used for. So Agreed. thanks. Um, Emma. Um, thank you, Chair. And um, yeah, well, I've, I've um, started asking a little while ago about this, and I'm really glad we got it on the agenda. Um, I'm not a moment too soon because a lot of questions are being asked. Um, and on my rare outings to my veg plot, um, I almost every time I get stopped by uh, one of the bereaved um, survivors, because a lot of them were moved slightly up in North Ken, uh, where I live, and saying, uh, where's the money? And it's really, really huge. It's not just one particular group. I know there's one particular group who are very mobilized at the moment. Um, um, but um, it's, you know, everybody is asking, where's the money? Where's the recovery? And so on. So um, I really hope we, that we won't be working in silos, that we're all working together. And so um, as we just heard, that there won't be any gaps 
um, and that there's a set number of things that, that the scrutiny committee is asking for about effectiveness and so nothing is missed. We really have to be thorough about this. Um, um, I was contacted today by a journalist saying this isn't going to happen until after the inquiry, is it? So that there's a rumour that it's all going to be held off. And I said, no, 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 we're doing this. This is the work. It's nothing to do with that. This is a different thing altogether. The inquiry is about her lead up. This is about recovery and where the money's going. So it's a different issue altogether. So um, I just think we have to be very, 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 very clear about this. Um, apart from that, um, the three um, the three parts, which I, I'm sure are, are you know, that it's all been very well thought through. I can see that. Um, I just keep on thinking, what what will what will people say is missing from it, apart from the the scrutiny issues, which are which are slightly different. Um, and um, I thought especially that one one thing which is very dear to people's heart is the is the staffing numbers. You know, I was quite I saw the audit one of the audit reports. Um, a couple of meetings ago, when it said there were 300 people involved um, yeah. on the, on the Grenf in the Grenfell Directorate, and I'm sure a lot of them are, you know, their outreach workers or whatever. That's absolutely fine. We need to know. People will want to know. They think, oh, they're all earning 100 grand a year and they're all wafting around in limousines or something. So let's be really specific. If you can say we've got this number of directors, we've got this number of this managers, and da 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 da, da just just in numbers. Yeah. So yeah. People know yeah, what indeed, yeah. I think would be helpful if that's okay. That's and what helpful, their responsibilities yeah. are, um, and obviously how much that costs and the pay levels and so on, because there's an awful lot of um, angst and pain about about people being paid and, and doing no work, and that's not I suppose this is what people are coming. Also, where the funding is from, is it our money? Has it come from yeah, government? Um, I'm sure that will come into it. Um, and my final thought was, when it comes out, well, there's going to be a lot of press interest, no doubt about that. Um, I'm just a little bit concerned when we talk about fraud-related activity. That's all the pe some people want to know. And I, there's always been in the community, there's always been a real division between people on the inside who asked for too much, who were, were affected, but somehow something went astray, they, they got too much or whatever it was, deliberately or not. And then the criminals who come in and abuse the system. And there's a real divide between that. We don't want to hear you know, 20 people committed fraud. No, 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 we want to say, okay, some people, in, this, this happened from some people, and then there were so many criminals who came in and abused the system. So I think there should be, you know, very much a split there, because the criminals who came in are not our people. Absolutely, yes, yeah. yeah. Get the yeah. The brush. So I think that's that's important. I'm sure there'll be other things, and if I, I may um, write to the chair if I can think of other things. I do get asked about it all the time. It's it's not just people angry about it. People are hurt, yeah. actually. They're very hurt by it. We need to show, and I want, I want whatever the report is to be something that I can put my hand up and say, you know, it isn't all great, but this is true. That's yeah. fine to say. Well, I think uh, the, it's transparency, which is what we're after. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, Chair, I, I think that's really helpful feedback. I'm happy to frame the um, the fraud aspect in a mm -hmm. way that does what uh, Council Dent Code suggested there i mean if, if it would be helpful to the committee we could provide um in an exempt session a more detailed briefing on the cases that have progressed if 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 the, if the committee would like to know well, that but it doesn't then sensationalize or take away from the the, the main focus of the report so happy to consider that if the committee would, would would want to do that as well i mean we do regularly look at at fraud that has occurred mm. with the grenfell disaster um and those are uh, you know, presented by Andy are, are are in the public domain, so we do have all that information that we can pull into this report uh, that I think would be would be very useful, and and I think it would it would be very useful for outsiders to see just how much work has gone into the fraud prevention um, and how much fraud there has been as well. I think that's that's an important part. As Sam points out yeah. for us to put into this report. Mm. As Council Dent Code points out, it's actually people coming in to commit the fraud rather than residents mm -hmm. who committed the fraud, which is well, a very, yeah, exactly. really important point to get across. Most of crime yeah. is committed by outsiders, and yes, that's never they never actually know that. No, indeed. So I think indeed. that would be really helpful. Thank you. Thank um, you. The, the, the other um, point that, that both um, that, that you've raised, Emma, is, is reports from the other um, committees. 
and we're all very worried about things slipping between the gaps, as Liz pointed out. Um, would it be helpful to circulate reports that are going to the other committees amongst our committee members? I mean, I know it's, it's, it's extra work and extra reading, but I think it's really important for us to, to look at what we're doing in context of what everyone else is doing. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, they'll all have slightly different time frames. Um, you know, as and when they they are published, I think I think if somebody can be responsible for sending them through to the committee members of the audit and transparency committee, that would be really helpful. And then make it clear somehow on the website or wherever, because people just don't know what's going on. It's a bit like the crawl report. I didn't know that it had been finished until it just landed in my inbox, which I was a bit pissed yeah. off about. But uh, just it's just information communication about that. People are really interested in this yeah. for good and bad reasons. Um, Ian, yeah. Um, just an observation. How, how did we think about getting this um, subject to uh, 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 being done by somebody external? Uh, we did. The money is very highly charged. Um, yeah. um, I don't. Uh, I don't know if I was uh, in my 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 war room. I might be thinking. If there was a lot of concern about this, why don't we get someone who's independent, a Price Waterhouse, whoever, audit it and have a report? Do you, do you think, why don't I make this suggestion? Why don't we cross that bridge when we get there in terms of let's have this meeting on the 11th of May, let's see this report, let's discuss it, and on the basis of that, decide what our recommendation would be. And maybe that recommendation recommendation would be to have an external report. Okay, yeah, I don't think it'll spoil for that sort of time. But I, I just wonder if it's so material, um, um, so high profile, it would be worth working again. I mean, these external reports are not fearsome and expensive. Either, actually, sorry, sorry, sure. a lot of people don't. Know. Don't trust outside auditors either. So. Anyway, <laughs> <No>. <laughs> and the external auditor does have oversight over all, all of the, the the expenditure of the authority, including the, the expenditure on Grenfell and Grenfell recovery. So it's yeah, but, but it's something we can pick up chair at the next meeting, as you say. Yes, that's a good point. We can certainly leverage off the external auditor on this in terms of their their input and feedback. Okay. And 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 chair, just to add, maybe we can include that in the report, David, to see various because it's not just uh, as part of the annual audit. There will be elements of the spend that would would have gone through other external scrutiny as well. Yes, um, that's very particularly, true. Yeah. Particularly in terms of uh, funding that may have been received from elsewhere. So maybe if we include that in the report, so the committee is completely cited on, you know, what audit and independent review has already taken place, and then you can make a judgment as to whether you um, want to do anything after. That sounds like a good plan. Thank yeah. you. Um, Andrew, is your hand still up or is that an old? No, it's, it, it, well, it, it is up semi because um, I will have to I will be have to go at 10 to 9. So um, if I forewarn you of that, it's like I was speaking to somebody else at 9 o'clock and. Uh, no problem. No problem. Um, okay. I'd like to also say that too. This is Kazad speaking. Okay, okay, we've all got to watch that TV project. So <laughs> okay, perfect. So, well, look, I think we've made some good progress on this. I think there's a good consensus. Um, so, Tara and David, carry on. With our Thank feedback. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank Brilliant. You can see. Right. right, so moving on swiftly, um, who's up? Moira? Who's Thanks, Chair. Yes, yeah, yeah. Moira. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Moira. Um, um, very, very briefly, you wanted some feedback on direct payments at this meeting, and um, we are going to have a more formal report to you in June, um, which we agreed with you, Chair, um, because there's quite a lot of work going on to improve the processes in direct payments. But we wanted to give you a bit of comfort that there was progress being made, which is why we've provided you with this very brief summary on so far the implementation of the recommendations from the previous audit and to uh, give you copies uh, of the actual audit so that you can see what was covered by them. Um, 
what I would ask is if there's anything particular that you'd like to raise or discuss at the June meeting, it'd be really helpful to know because um, I'm liaising with our colleagues in adult social care so that they give you what, what you would like. Uh, colleagues, uh, Liz, question. Just quickly, I suppose the one thing that stood out to me is that the high priority uh, recommendations haven't been implemented and if, if more could be done to push those, I think that would be helpful. Yep, that's absolutely fine. Some, some of the recommendations do take a little while to be um, embedded so that we can actually check that they are effective. Um, so we, we can we can't give you assurances on on those yet there was only one not implemented and two partially we're going to be doing some more work on this in uh, the tail end of april beginning of may and by which time we hope to give you a much better picture on that okay thank you uh, uh emma thank you chair um just very briefly i um you know from the other end um, the um, direct payments are, can be, um, for some people, absolute hell. Um, it's a very, very complex system and it feels, for some people who aren't very well and taking loads of drugs, um, uh, punitive and they feel they're being you know, punished by bureaucracy. Um, it, is, it is really, really difficult and um, um, I have one uh, constituent who found it the, basically um, the, this system contributed but not entirely to her suicide um, and she, she just found the whole process so such agony and so difficult and it was because you know partly because she was ill and she was in pain and she took loads of drugs and she couldn't think straight um, and um, you know I just I just think we have to think about this when we're when we're looking at setting up a system which is fair and uh, fraud resistant <laughs> so uh, that's yeah. just no, thank you, absolutely you. and in fact, this is, you know, there are a number of teams that have to work together on this to make it happen, in, including the people who provide support to the actual service users, as well as those people who need to get the financial side of it correct. And they do need to work together very, quite, very closely. And I've been liaising with the uh, the lead on this in adult social care to make sure that that happens. It's, they, they are very acutely aware of that. Uh, can I just clarify one point? Uh, in relation to what Councillor Dent Code said, which is, I thought that in adult social care direct payments, you were never required to use that route. It was an option of uh, for people of a way of having care delivered. So it's not it's different to um, say universal be benefit uh, credit, which can be um, mandatory. There are different ways of providing support. Yes, so there are, and sometimes it's not appropriate for direct payments, and, no, and that not, decision no. will be made for you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Maura, and thank you for the work okay. so far. Good to see that. Well, I mean, I suppose the headlines are: fifteen percent of recommendations are implemented, fifty-four percent are on the go, and thirty-one percent we will start mm. on soon. Yes, there, there's progress being made, but it, it's not something you can do overnight and COVID did have an impact as well. <laughs> we completely understand, um, but we look forward to hearing from you in, in June. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to A11, we got Matt. We have. Poor Matt, to wait all evening and now we're going to rush him through his Treasury report. <laughs> Uh, so, Matt, basically, last time we spoke, we were talking about negative interest rates, and now, presumably, the, the, the danger is inflation and increasing interest rates. It's interesting, isn't it? Thank you, Chair. The, uh, the, one of the first things that happens when, when rhetoric changes on interest rates is the, fo the forward rates change and yeah. checking those forward rates this morning in preparation for this they are now in positive territory again so whilst in december we were still talking about uh, a very low prospect of, uh, of zero interest rates uh, one of the forecasters has, has now put a zero percent chance on that for uh, for the rest of uh, 2021 so if i could just refer quickly I, won't, I promise i won't keep you very long we could start at uh, 3.1 to just sum yeah. up the december quarter business as usual no no borrowing decisions 
Uh, fixed term deposits, obviously, as I've, as I've said previously at this committee, every time a deposit matures, uh, we replace it with something at a far less um, interest rate. So that's reflected in the fixed term deposits. Money market funds, the same thing. A little bit of cushioning, but largely they're going to between zero and two basis points, and that will feed through in the next quarter. So relatively stable in terms of overall cash. Uh, I'll ask the committee to just look briefly at 4.3, which is quite a nice graph to show that because you've invested your cash in the longer term, it does show that throughout the, 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 last, uh, the last sort of nine months, you are protected from that interest rate reduction. You know, had we all been in, in money market funds, then the impact of that would have been felt a lot sooner. But the, the, the fact that you've been locking in, in deals at a higher interest rate just goes to show that the, the effect of the 0.1% the just took a bit of time to, to feed through. Uh, I've probably not got a lot else to say other than uh, we are in line with the prudential indicators. We're compliant with all and we did we did take the the chair's feedback at the last meeting that we we shouldn't wait for strategies to be approved we should we should look at look at uh, have a, you know have a fresh approach to the way we work we actually held a meeting with uh, the head of finance in december and your new consultant we then took the findings of that to councillor will in january so everything's actually been included in the 21 uh, Treasury strategy. For the purposes of time, it's largely two changes, which is the ability to invest in enhanced money market funds, which is it boosts a return through if you're an in, in enhanced money market fund, you can typically go to the very short end of the bond market for a bit of rate pickup. We've also got the ability to invest in investment grade bond funds. So it's not all bond funds. We, we very much want to keep uh, investment grade, which is you know, typically triple B and above. So we, we want high grade credit. It's not going to shoot the lights out, but in a world where we are fighting for every basis point, it it should uh, prop up and, and provide some good stable income without undue risk. So that's where we are. And we'll be looking to do that in the next, in the, in the, in the coming weeks. Thank you, Matt. Excellent report as always. Any questions from any of the members? No, I think that's it for you, Matt. Thank you very Thank much. You. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Take Thank care. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Bye. Right. A12. Um... That's me again, Chair. Oh, right. Um, very, very briefly, it's a brief report. As you know, we started our work a little bit late this year, but there is a lot in progress. Um, just to say, really, that the... You know, it's very positive that the areas that we have done follow-ups in have shown a good implementation of recommendations. And just to sort of flag up that there is a lot of work still in progress. Unfortunately, that means your year-end report will be a little weighty. Um, but uh, at the moment, I'm not aware of anything significant from the reports that are coming through in drafts. Um, I'm just happy to take any questions if anyone has any on the plan. Uh, Liz has got a question. Go yeah, it's just just quick. I just had I, I looked at the November papers and I had trouble tying in with things were in progress into this report, and that okay. may have been because it was you know it was quite a big pack we had to go through. I might have been getting a bit tired, but uh, I just had issues sort of tying them in and just just getting the the flow through that everything's being covered off. Yeah, um, it was a different way of reporting it uh, in November and. It's kind of moved on a little bit. There's an extra column with draft reports in now. Um, and it, to be honest, if this report had been written even a week later, I probably wouldn't have had the being scoped in there because it would have moved again. Uh, we'll try and make it a little bit clearer for you. Um, maybe when we talk about the plan for next year, that might help. Um, so, yeah, it, I I'd also had to cross -check, check them. And I, I'm pretty sure I got most of them. Some of them, the names changed slightly, but I do try yeah. to keep it consistent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. And I do uh, do want to, to have a good read through the Appendix 2. Um, yeah. Uh, relating to 
what is expected of us as as committee members. Chair, I don't know if it helps, but um, Lublin, Lublin is here actually for accountant to, is has been pa patiently waiting with us. So I don't oh, know if she wants okay. to give a brief sort of um, overview of that. Just it is something that our external audit has asked us to do to make sure you were exactly. clearly cited on the implications and the changes in the aud auditing standards um, going forward. Thanks, David. Yeah, one of the things we are trying to implement um, and enhance the way that we work in is trying to bring as many different um, matters that we can where it will help um, the understanding of the audit committee around some of the different areas of the accounts um, and some of the work that we do. And as I said, this is uh, an international account auditing standard change that has been brought about. Um, if you link it all the way back, it links to Enron and some of the failings there. Um, and it's around the increasing and enhancing the way in which um, audit carry out their challenge and critical review work. Um, and so it's all around the account accounting estimations that we use. And I picked up in the report the key areas where we do use those um, more uh, materially uncertain or significant estimates within the accounts and where we rely on any third party information. If you've got any questions around any of the content, I'm happy to answer those. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Liz has got a question. Unless that's an old hand. Sorry. Um, sorry, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, you, I see you picked up ex expected credit losses under IFRS 9. Um, what, what puzzled, puzzled me, obviously they are quite sort of judgmental, but what puzzled me, we've picked them up here, but the auditors, and maybe it was a question for the auditors, not for yourself, the auditors didn't pick them up as an area of um, significant risk. So, I was just no, yeah, yeah, so in terms of the actual risk element to it, um, it's not one that they consider there to be that much risk. It's a provision, a set aside amount, where um, that what they look at is just the rationale that we use in calculation because as you say it is a very subjective area and we are doing a lot of forecasting within the estimates there but they do believe that the process we use they audit them every year and they're happy that they are robust in terms of uh, the assumptions we're using you might need to pick that up with the auditors when they um when they report back if we've got to be assured Um, Lubna, are you going to do that or should we get to put a note Absolutely. in there? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, they will actually be uh, uh, putting yeah. it specifically within their um, reports and some of the documents I mentioned earlier around the audit progress reports and so on. They have said that these are the areas they will be picking up. So they will definitely be covering expected losses for this. But yes, I can I can take that with them. Thank you. Any further questions on a no, no, no. Am I missing something here? Where, I can't find A13. Um, sorry to interrupt and sorry to appear. No I do have to go now. No problem. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you for your time and your wisdom tonight. Um, any further questions on A12? So, then moving on to A13, which I don't appear to have. What is that? Chair, that's the audit plan. Audit plan. Yeah. Um, right. Do you, Who can take page three, three hundred and three, Chair, on in the in the combined pack. Yeah. No, I printed them out individually. Ah, sorry. Right. <laughs> um, right. David, can you talk? So, to so yeah, Moira, do you want to briefly uh, introduce? Sorry. Yes, please. Uh, yeah. Can sorry. Yes, it's again for me again. <laughs> Um, yeah, so that this is the uh, proposed or a draft of the proposed audit plan for next year. Um, this year has taught us even more than in previous years that trying to plan a whole year in advance is really, really difficult. Um, and what we're trying, we're aiming to do is is to identify sort of the, the key areas where we believe the council has persistent risks. Um, so that we can make sure we've got a plan over the next sort of three to five years of areas we should at least cover and be proactive in. But we need to be flexible and respond quicker in some other areas uh, where risks change. Um, and the uh, 
the, the pandemic has proven that it that plans can change quite quickly. Um, and what we're proposing is to have a, a fairly firm idea of what we'll be doing in quarter one, um, and then a, a general view for, for quarters two to four, um, which we will be refreshing on a quarterly basis and bringing that to the committee as well. But more importantly, we're, we are liaising very much more frequently with the uh, directorates and talking with the management teams about where their key areas of risk are or any areas of concern. And um, they've generally welcomed this approach and we're, we're quite optimistic that it will make us uh, enable us to provide a much more agile and timely reporting. Um, that's it really. I mean, there's obviously look quite a lot in there, but we will be bringing this to you quite frequently um, so that you can see what's happening and, and where the key issues are. Thank you, Maura. I've got it up on my screen. Um, apologies for that. Uh, we have a question from Cosette. has gone. Sorry, sorry. I, was mute. I apologize. <laughs> Thank you for calling me chair, uh, because I'll have to depart right after this, I'm afraid. But I did, um, I did want to ask the question. Um, in the last agenda item towards the end of that document, there is a statement that says that one of the committee's roles over the next 12 months will be to ensure that the highest standards of internal control are maintained and not compromised by budget cuts, and that the council continues to respond well to the challenges posed by the COVID pandemic. And I just was curious to know with regard to this audit plan, was it in any way curtailed or constrained due to budget cuts or any other financial challenge? Uh, no, no, the, the, the plan is, is created by us independently based on the risks and uh, assurance, other forms of assurance that we can get. Um, it is We have had no pressure put on us whatsoever due to any impact on the budget. I mean, obviously, we're keen to be efficient and effective. Um, and one of the things that we have been doing is when we've been meeting with the senior management teams is to ask them what other assurances they have so that we can we can be involved in that, have a look at that and provide us with some confidence in areas which we may not want to then look into as well because it would be a duplication of effort. So we're trying to be effective and efficient as well. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Cosette. Uh, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you. Uh, have a good evening. Any further questions? Apart from my groveling apologies of, of uh, not having printed this out and written notes on it. But we always welcome any feedback any of you have on the plan. So, you know, if, if any of you do have any in, in, information or areas that you think we, we are missing, then please obviously let us know. No comments. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, which moves on to A14, uh, which is uh, my report, uh, which goes to council in the next council meeting. Does anyone have any comments on that? Uh, I'm um, M-U-R-R-A-L-L. Oh, apologies, I'll have to change that. It's normal yes. spelling, but um, I'm a -L -L. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's my fault. Yeah, I will change that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Anything else? Um, great. Well, thank you very much. Um, that was quite a marathon session. Um, is there any other uh, areas of outstanding business? Uh, no. Uh, well, that was a marathon session, and thank you very much for everybody's uh, patience and the hard work that, that officers have put in to getting this together for us. Thank you to the members um, for going through this. I thought it worked. Um, it was a good evening um, and bodes well for our next meeting on the 11th of May and onwards. Uh, on that note, I shall leave you all to go and get your supper and have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Ian.